Uh, today is uh, Wednesday, uh, April 22nd. Yeah, this, today we will be doing our second lecture on the digestive system, uh, two of three. And then uh, one week from today is going to be your next exam. Uh, you have two assignments due next week. Uh, they are going to be your physio ex exercise eight. So that should keep you busy this weekend. Again, it's not hard, just time consuming. And there's only four activities for that one. So that's not too bad. And your unit tw 24 review is due as well. So both of those are due online uh, at the beginning of class on Monday. Uh, I've gotten some good feedback on the exams so far, the process of the exams, which is what I asked for. Uh, and one of those, and again, one of those things that, uh, especially as we've been going along with the lecture, the lecture has been more challenging that way, uh, has been the histology. So there's been several requests for help with the histology. So what I've decided to do uh, for the digestive system, because there is so much histology in it, uh, that I will do a histology review. I will try to put together some histology slides, some good obvious histology slides. Uh, and then on Friday uh, at 9 a.m., I will do a histology review where we'll go through the handout together and talk about the things on there and things that can be challenging. I appreciate that, that it'll be in my, my normal Zoom office room. So again, you'll just connect to room 916-484-8992. Um, and I appreciate that not everybody necessarily will be able to make it to that time. So I will be recording it so that you'll have that opportunity to look at that. But I do strongly encourage you to come so that you can ask questions. If nobody shows up, then I'm not doing the review. So someone, if you want that help with the histology, then I please encourage you to come. And as long as I get a one or two people that show up, although the more the better, uh, you can ask the questions and make sure that you get the information. So I do wanna see if we can try that to see if that'll be something. That way, rather than shoehorning it into what is already in a long and exhausting lecture, it might be a good idea to have the opportunity to just focus just on the histology and be able to do that. But of course, the main thing I wanna talk about is uh, first the, uh, or the exams, plural. Uh, starting first with the exam you just took. Uh, the exam, uh, the grades were not spectacular. Uh, the lab exam uh, is about a 74%, which wasn't bad for this exam. The lecture exam was a lot worse than I expected on this, but I do appreciate that there was a lot of information on this exam. The good news is our overall grades are still holding pretty well. Uh, and I do wanna talk a little bit about the curve. The curve for these is a little bit awkward uh, because of the way that Canvas handles the exams. I can't change the value of the exam. So one of the things that was mentioned uh, before we started is like on the lab exam, normally uh, what ends up happening is it may be out of 60 questions, but if the top score was a 53 or 54, then we curve it to that 54 and that one you know, becomes the curve. The curve doesn't work that way on this one. Uh, the advantage of that curve is that everybody gets some improvement, but at the same time, when I'm curving it like that, it also drops the overall value of that test. So if the class as a whole doesn't do particularly well, and so the top score is like a 52, for instance, then that exam becomes out of 52 points, and it de-emphasizes that exam a little bit on the overall uh, score. So everybody does relatively better on that exam, but it doesn't have a huge impact on the overall grade that way. Uh, the problem with Canvas is I can't skew the points. I can't decrease the points of an assignment. So once an appointment is set, like 60 points for those 60 questions, there's no way for me to change that. And uh, curving it so that the top score becomes 60 um, skews the grades overall in a way that isn't acceptable. And so that's why the curves are set up the way they are. They aren't normally curved the way that they would be, uh, but you are getting a similar boost to them that way you would be in a normal class. So I think it won't affect the overall grades uh, impacting that way. I just know that it doesn't feel as good that way, to, uh, but, but again, the impact should be similar for that for your overall grades. Uh, so again, but, and I know that there were challenges to this, and we talked about this on Monday as well, you know, one of my goals is always to make sure that the test doesn't get in the way of you showing me the information. That's why I always feel that it's so important for me to try to be very standardized in the way that I uh, ask the questions and, and present the material to you on the exam so that uh, the process doesn't get in the way of you showing me you have the information. And again, this is a brand new format for all of us that we're all dealing with, and I'm, and I appreciate that the process definitely was one of those things that got in the way. Uh, 
Now, the other important thing for me is that uh, there are two important things. Obviously, uh, maintaining the integrity of the class is something that is very, very important, not just for this semester, but for all future semesters as well. But at the same time, I also want the exams to be a learning process for you. I purposely just posted the grades on yesterday, but I do want you to know that starting today after class, I'm not going to do it before class because if I did it before class, you'd all be looking at your exams and not paying any attention to me. But after class today, I will, oops, why is that not writing? Ah, that's where it should be. Hold on. Let me get rid of that. Put this here. So after class today, I will be releasing your exams for review so that you will have the opportunity to look at the exams. Uh, I did not make a lot of comments on them because at the time I had not decided whether or not I was going to release them at all. Uh, so a couple of them have a few minor uh, um, uh, comments that I've added to them, but there is not a lot on that. But I do want this to be a learning process. So what I'm going to do is be releasing the exams for review. I will then be available either in Zoom or by email to answer any questions. So if you want to go over anything, if you're not clear why you got the points you did or something like that, uh, I will be doing that. However, they will be available for re uh, review for only 24 hours. So basically tomorrow, and tomorrow is what, Thursday? At noon, when I start my 431 lecture, I will be relocking the exams. And will not be available again after that. So like I said, I want you to have the opportunity to look at your lab and lecture exams, understand uh, what you did well, uh, what you didn't uh, do well with, and that's really the point. The learning point is to see what you did poorly uh, so that we can learn from this process. Because like I said, for better or for worse, uh, this is going to be the format for the rest of the semester. Uh, campus, regardless of what happens in the state and what happens with everything else, uh, we are completing the semester online. So this is the format for the rest of the semester. And so uh, I, it is important that we understand this process. All right, and so that you can get past the process and get to the point of being able to show me that you have the information. All right, so again, I want this previous exam to be a learning process, and so that is going to be important, and, and, and that's an important part of that. Uh, for the future exams, uh, what I will tell you is that the lecture format uh, will be the same uh, as the previous one. So again, there will be multiple choice questions, there will be fill in the blank questions, there will be essay questions. They will be randomly assigned and you will get all of them at once. However, for the lab exams, thankfully from a procedural standpoint, there weren't too many issues with the um, lab, I mean with the exams as a whole. And again, like I said, I had four exams last week, so I got an immersive class in how this works. Um, but the few problems that did uh, perk up tended to be associated with the lab exam, the lab exam format. So it is not 100% decided. However, and again, one of the things that you got to realize is, you know, I'm not, you know, drinking margaritas on the back porch when I'm not, uh, the, you know, with that, when it's not the four and a half hours that I'm spending with you in class. And one of the things that I've been in, uh, we've been doing a lot is there's a tremendous amount of communication and contact going on with the lecturers, on the, uh, with the instructors, on the best ways to be handling and dealing with this information. And this is one of those areas uh, where... Um, we are, uh, there's a tremendous amount of discussion on how things are going. And uh, for better or for worse, you guys have the next exam coming up. Uh, so what I, uh, while it is not 100% decided, what I am thinking of doing is doing the lab exam in the same format as the lecture. What uh, one of the concerns is about the loading, especially like, and again, it wasn't as big of a deal for you guys, but like, for instance, my 430 class, they were doing the muscular system and their lab exam had 80 questions. And so there's been some concern about, uh, you know, how the computer, how Canvas will handle populating the screen with 80 questions, with 80 large images that people have to constantly scroll up and down through. 
Uh, the fact that we are doing one organ system and we've got a short turnaround and we're doing it next week, uh, there is some discussion that uh, we may, I may try to switch the format of the lab exams uh, to just having it all present on the screen at once and then so then you can scroll through them and answer them in any order and be able to go back and do those types of things. I know it is not uh, as similar to the format that we normally do in the lab exam, but normally in the lab exams you do have the opportunity, whether it is uh, the PowerPoint presentation going around a second time or um, like the station-based exams, if something from one question triggers something with something else, you have that opportunity to go back and change it. And so this format would allow you to do that. I think presenting one at a time, but allowing students to go back is not, is the worst of both situations. Uh, because it is a timed exam, uh, it takes a lot of time to populate the screens with the images. And if you suddenly remember something from 14 slides ago and you have to go back and canvas 14 slides to then come forward 14 slides to continue the exam, uh, that is not gonna be conducive to success on that. So we may, I may try uh, the idea of just having it all populated on the screen at once in the same format as the uh, lecture exam and maybe see how that works. So again, I'm not 100% decided on that. Uh, uh, again, uh, with the four exams last week, I have been focused solely on my grading and not too much looking forward on this, uh, but there have been discussions. And so I think that may be something uh, that uh, could be, could, I'm, I'm hoping it will resolve the issues that we did have and I'm hoping it won't cause new ones. So it is something uh, that is being discussed. The last thing I wanna talk about is the final. We are still having a final exam. It is still going to be cumulative, but I have no idea of the format of what it is going to be. Typically, it is all multiple choice questions because, again, uh, with a cumulative final exam, it makes more sense to be able to pull the information out of the ether as opposed to... Um, as opposed to having to come up with the information from scratch. Uh, so I'm not sure what the format for that might be. Maybe it would be, um, uh, maybe it would be uh, uh, multiple choice. Uh, if maybe it would be essay questions. If it was essay questions, then, uh, then maybe there will be some type of uh, uh, cheat sheet that would be allowed for something like that, but then the logistics of that are horrible. So I have no idea, like I said, I have, it, it, I know it is something that needs to be addressed and needs to be uh, resolved, but I don't know what that is going to be yet. But the key is there is gonna be a cumulative final exam and there will still be a benefit. Uh, oh, that's what I was gonna do. Uh, still be a benefit for, um, for doing well on it. Right, normally it's replacing one of the lecture scores. I don't know if it will truly fully replace it, uh, but there will still be a benefit for doing well on the final to help you. Because again, the whole point of this is to master this material and retain this information. And being successful in the final exam uh, would allow you to do that. Uh, the last thing is I know there isn't, uh, the, I know just uh, Jeff is doing some kind of virtual open lab. Uh, I don't know if he's still doing it or how often he is doing that. I know the science skills is still something that can be done, uh, but I think we're past the date when that can be. And so for extra credit, uh, I will also allow uh, for anybody who comes to the open lab, uh, for the, pardon me, not the open lab, but to the Zoom histology, I will provide extra credit for that as well. Uh, extra credit. Uh, if you come to that, I don't know how much yet. We'll figure that. I'll figure that out as well. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, five points or something like that for coming and participating in that three points. I don't know. We'll figure something out. Uh, but that could be something that uh, would help as well. And if it's something that's successful, then maybe it'll be something we'll continue uh, through the reproductive system, which also has a tremendous amount of histology as well. Yes, if you went to any, any previous open labs you went to, that you will absolutely get the extra credit for that as well. And if you completed the science skills, which I know at least one person has done, uh, then uh, you will get it from that as well, yes. So yes, you absolutely will get your extra credit from um, anything and any open lab time that you went to beforehand. Uh, but like I said, because not everybody had the opportunity to get in their full 15 minutes, 15 hours, uh, we may try to find a way to supplement that as well. All right. Questions on any of that? I think that is the game plan. Again, one of the things, like I said, is uh, it, one of the challenges of this process that we've been doing is simply the fact that 
the process itself is getting in the way in the learning, right? And again, it is something that that I don't want and don't like. And so it's one of the, again, one of the reasons why I've tried to be as honest with you guys as I can in this process, open with you guys in this process, as transparent as possible in this process, so that you know exactly what it is that is expected of you so that you can be successful. And so uh, the problem is there are still a lot of questions. There are still a lot of things about this process that we're all learning. I know it's challenging for you guys. It is equally challenging for us as instructors. So it is something uh, that I'm working on. Is that extra a practice exam we took still going to be extra? Yes, it should be set up as extra credit. Now I should have, uh, I believe that has been, um, I thought I was able to change that. So uh, yeah, you should, if you, if you look at that extra credit assignment, you should have five points, but it should be out of zero. So I think that it was able to be changed that way. If not, it is definitely extra credit and that's how it's counted in my official grade book. And that's the other thing too. Remember, I do still have, it is five out of five, not five out of zero. Okay. Well, uh, it will be, it is five points of extra credit. So it does count as extra credit. It doesn't count towards your total. And so if you notice my total might be slightly different from yours as well because of that. Uh, I showed the class at a 727.5. I get my guess is that uh, uh, your uh, your grade book shows it out of then what what 732.5 or something like that. I don't know. You'd have to look at that and see. Um, but yes, uh, th there's only so much that I can do with the Canvas grade book, especially with these proctored exams. But I do still have an official grade book where I'm keeping the official scores, and and for the most part they're the same. Although I'll be honest, I didn't check them. Uh, from the previous exam to this uh, when we posted this exam to see if they match what's in my grade book uh, But I do have that and and uh, so again That's something over as you're looking at your exams. If you have questions about that I'd be happy to answer that too over the next 24 hours All right Excellent. I had a question. Yes You said the um, the final might not replace like a uh, past exam uh, Well, so like I said in the classroom typically what happens all of our lecture exams are worth 100 points. The final exam is worth 100 points. And the final exam has, you have the opportunity to use the final exam to replace your lowest lecture score. So basically you can get additional points added into your, your lowest exam score to bring it up to that. Uh, I will be doing something similar to that, but some of it is also gonna depend on the format of the final. If there's gonna be essay questions on the final, that makes the final harder. And so it, 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 I don't necessarily want to, um, uh, the, the, and if it's harder, then the, the scores may be slightly lower. Now, I'd like my whiteboard, but that virtual thing is distracting me, which is also the reason why I don't have the camera on uh, during, the, uh, during the lecture as well, but that's bugging me. All right, let's get rid of that. Um, as the scores come, uh, if the final score comes down, then I don't want to necessarily use it as a straight replacement. So what I may do, I do a percentage or do a certain number of points or something like that. Again, the logistics of that have to be determined. So I have to determine how to do that. But the key is uh, you do need to know this information. And so there definitely has to be a, a cumulative final exam of some form. And I most definitely want to reward you for gaining that information. So if you've gained that information and uh, uh, and been successful with it, then I want to reward you in some way. So I, I will try to find uh, an equivalent way to do that. If it, if it turns out being multiple choice and 100 points, then maybe it will just be a sweet, straight switch. Uh, but if, if it's determined that I need to change the format, then I also will probably change the reward system as well. Uh, science skills. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the science skills is still relevant, unfortunately, at this point, but uh, there was uh, um, science skills is the science success center. Uh, sorry, it used to be called the science skills center. I always keep forgetting that there was that science success center that we talked about at the beginning of the semester uh, where it's actually an online class now that you could take. But it's it's a uh, it's a six to eight week class and there isn't six weeks left yet. So enrollment, I don't believe is allowed in it anymore. But uh, there were some people who signed up for the science success skills. It was that half unit class that you could take where you met once a week with someone and did uh, uh, learning activities. So, you know, like concept mapping and, you know, uh, reading the textbook and things along those lines. So it, it was, a, it was a, a tutorial type of process that the, that the campus has. But like I said, it's not relevant. If you haven't done it, if you did do it, you get the points. But if you haven't done it, I don't think it's, you're, it's capable of, of being signed up for anymore. I think it's like class 493 or something like that. I don't know. All right. 
Any other questions on the process, the procedure, the exams, or anything along those lines? <laughs> it's not a matter of wanting to make the exam harder with essay questions. Uh, I, 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 again, I appreciate that this is hard. It, it's, it has to do with maintaining the integrity of the class and, and multiple choice questions in the online format is not necessarily a very successful way of doing that. So like I said, it, I, I, I literally, it, it, it's like I said, I have no idea of the format of the final. I, I, other than knowing that I have to do something with the final, I have not made any decisions on what the final is going to be. Uh, I, you know, where I want to, I want to have a better understanding from myself and from other instructors who have been using multiple choice questions on their exams to see what the scores on those are like compared to those in the classroom environment. Um, and yeah, the, it, true, it works both ways. But at the same time, an essay question on the entire semester where you have to pull information from the third week of class when we were still on campus uh, is not necessarily fair either, which would be why I would maybe provide you with some type of, you know, uh, maybe, maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe I would make this cheat sheet and put it up at the top of the screen or something like that, you know, where the, the instructions are. I don't know. I, again, I have not made any decisions and I'm certainly not going to make any decisions between now and the beginning of lecture. So just be aware that something is, um, that something there, I will be discussing the format. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is yet. I have not given it any serious thought yet, but I will get to it. And, and on Monday, when we come back, I will have more information for you. All right. So again, I don't worry about the final. We have two sections we have to worry about before we get to the final. So the final should be the least of your concerns right now. You have to be worried about the digestive system. Uh, uh, Right now, yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah, so we're always worried. We're all worried now. Yes, exactly. That's the world we live in now. Um, but uh, we will uh, again. We'll get to the final when we're done. But let's focus now on the digestive system. So, any other questions other than concerns about the final exam? All right. Well, I'm going to let's switch gears then to the lecture. There. And let me go ahead and stop the video so I'm not distracted by myself, and that way I can also pick my nose. All right, excellent. We left off last time and we were finishing up our discussion of the first major organ, the oral cavity, the mouth, and all the accessory structures that went along with it. And as I mentioned, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the teeth I think the types of teeth, the orders of the teeth, the two sets of teeth, the numbers associated with those, while that is all stuff that you guys are responsible for, I think it's all stuff that is pretty simple and straightforward. However, one of the things that I have noticed is people do sometimes have uh, some problems with the basic anatomy of the tooth. So I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, before we move forward talking about that. The key to the tooth, as we can see here, is the tooth is a bone-like structure, right? It is not a bone, right? Remember when we learned our bones in the uh, 430, we did not identify the teeth as bones, but they're bone-like structures. Uh, there are two things that kind of make them bone-like. Uh, the uh, most obvious is the enamel. The enamel, which is what covers the crown of the tooth, is made of those same hydroxyapatite crystals that we see in our bones. Again, those hydroxyapatite crystals are made up of calcium and carbonate and phosphates and all sorts of things like that. It is the hardest substance that is produced by a human body. But the big difference between the enamel of our teeth and our bones is our bones, remember, are about 25% uh, pardon me, about 50% hydroxyapatite crystals and about 25% collagen fibers. And that collagen fibers, while we have the rigidity of the hydro hydroxyapatite crystals, uh, it also has some flexibility and some give. Our enamel is essentially 100% hydroxyapatite crystals. It gives it tremendous strength, but it also has no give, it has no flexibility. So with that strength also comes a brittleness 
So that's why when you're drink, you know, you're drowning your sorrows of Gronkowski coming back and going to Tampa Bay and, and, and uh, you know, uh, TB going to Tampa Bay and you're drowning your sorrows in your big bowl of clam chowder. When you bite down on that clam shell, the enamel of your tooth does not have any give and it can crack or it can shatter as a result of that. The other way that it's like tooth is kind of on the inside. The material on the inside is uh, called dentin. And these dentin are arranged in these tubular-like structures. Dentin is a unique uh, uh, tissue, but it is very, very similar to like a calcified cartilage. And we learned about what an important role cartilage uh, uh, plays in the formation of bones, in the growth of bones, in the recovery and healing of bones. So this is kind of a calcified cartilage-like material that is the inside of the bone. As I also mentioned, the bone has three regions. The first is the crown, and that is the part that is covered with the enamel. That is the part that is exposed, right? That's your bright, shiny white teeth that you look at when you smile in the mirror. The body of it is comprised of dentin, but on the outer surface of the tooth, where there is not the enamel, is a substance that is known as cementum. Cementum is basically, all right, the candy-coated shell on the outer surface. It lines the outer surface, but like a candy-coated shell, doesn't have a lot of protection to it. It's a fairly thin, uh, fairly uh, weak, for lack of a better term, tissue. So it's not going to provide the type of protection that the enamel is going to. The good news is the majority of the tooth that is covered with cementum is embedded within the alveoli of the tooth, I mean, pardon me, of the jaw. So either the mandible, and this looking like a tooth pointing up, this is probably the mandible or the maxilla coming from the, the top. We have these bony sockets or what are called the alveoli. And these bony alveoli is where the tooth sits. This tooth is then held in place by a ligament, right? If you remember back to when we learned about joints, all joints we were responsible for knowing the structural classification. All joints we were responsible for knowing the functional classification. And uh, with our structural classifications, we have specific types. As I'm sure you remember, because you did it so well, uh, uh, when it comes to, there we go, our teeth, that joint, the structural classification of it is fibrous, because it is this fibrous ligament, the periodontal ligament, that is what anchors the tooth, connects the tooth to the bone. Right, structural classification is what type of tissue holds the two bones together. Technically, we don't have two bones. We have a bone and a bone-like structure, but that's enough to make it a joint, and it is a fibrous classification. The specific type, I'm sure if you remember, is the funnest one to say, gumphosis. And how much do your teeth wiggle around inside of your face? Hopefully not too much. So, of course, the functional classification is no movement or, more appropriately, a sin arthrosis. Oops. So those are the M and you definitely need to know that. That is all testable material, but it's all stuff you should have remembered from 430 anyway. So like I said, the majority of the cementin is attached to the periodontal ligament, anchoring the tooth into the uh, bone. And that portion that is anchored into the bone is what is known as the root. And that just leaves us this narrow region in between. And this is why your doctor, your dentist more specifically, is always on you on flossing properly and taking good care of your teeth. And more specifically, taking good care of your gums. Your gums or gingiva covers a narrow region of the tooth known as the neck. This neck does not have the enamel on it. That means it is covered with cementum 
but it's not embedded within the bone. So it is exposed. Well, not completely exposed because the gums protect it. So this region, this narrow neck region is protected only by your gums. And your gums are not very strong. They're not like bone, they're not like enamel. Uh, if you do not treat your teeth and your gums well, one of the things that will happen is your gums can recede or your gums can swell. And if that occurs, that increases the likelihood of bacterial infection in this area. And this is an area of vulnerability to the tooth. So that's the key to those, those three regions and the things that protect them or barely protect them. The other part that I feel people sometimes are confused by is uh, the center portion of this. The center portion of the tooth is hollow. There is a cavity and that cavity is of course called the pulp cavity. Of course, it's not a hollow cavity. That cavity has stuff in it and the stuff that it has in it is the pulp. So pulp sits in the pulp cavity. Pulp is an areolar connective tissue with blood vessels and nerves. This is, these nerves here in your pulp cavity, a part of your pulp, are what get exposed uh, from damage, that cavity, outside air, other side irritants, bacteria, things like that, that penetrate the tooth and get in here, irritate those and give you that toothache, right? If your uh, enamel uh, thins too much or your gums recede too much, you may be hypersensitive to temperature, cold or hot things because uh, that temperature can affect those nerves. But like I said, if it becomes painful from a cavity, then what you get is a root canal where that doctor takes the drill, drills down the center of the tooth, destroying those nerves and the pulp, right? So that um, destroying the nerves and the pulp so that the tooth basically dies as a result of that. They fill it then with their resin, right? Use that ultraviolet light and it looks all pretty and shiny on the outside, but it's pretty much dead on the inside. The last thing that I think people are sometimes confused by is again, if you look at it, it has kind of a cone-like appearance. Obviously the base is up and the apex is down, the tip is down. And obviously these blood vessels and nerves uh, and you know lymphatic vessels and all those things have to find a way in. So there is an apical foramen at the apex, the bottom of the tooth where those nerves and things enter into the pulp. All right, so like I said, I think those are the key components to the anatomy of that, that I think people sometimes have some uh, difficulty with. So hopefully that helps to clarify that. All righty, questions on the anatomy of the tooth. Again, remember you're still gonna be responsible for, um, you're still gonna be responsible for the number of teeth, the types of teeth, the function of the teeth, all of that is still materially responsible for, but like I said, it's pretty straightforward and in the interest of time, I will let you work on that on your own. If there's really some questions, then when we're doing histology on Friday, I will answer any other questions that we have then as well. All right, with that, we are done with all of the anatomy of the oral cavity and we are ready to leave the oral cavity. And of course, when we leave the oral cavity, we go into the pharynx. Luckily, we learned about the pharynx in the respiratory system. So we know the pharynx is divided by, into three regions and those regions are determined by the openings they're associated with. So the nasal pharynx is open to the nasal cavity. The oral pharynx is open to the oral cavity. The laryngopharynx is open to the larynx through the uh, epiglottis and down through the glottis. We also learned the histology of this. We know that the nasal pharynx, because it is a passageway just for air, is lined with a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Whereas the oropharynx and laryngopharynx, which is a passageway for both food and drink, as well as air, is lined with a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, similar to what we see in the oral cavity, to protect us from that hot coffee and that acidic wine and all the other things we are going to be eating and drinking as well. From here, we know air passes into the larynx and down the trachea, Food needs to pass down the pharynx into the, oh, and there's the other pretty picture that shows it again. It's all those things. Um, 
into the esophagus. The esophagus, and uh, this is more, again, I know they've shown the picture here, but really uh, this cross section would really be more in the proximal two thirds of this. So where they cut it is really kind of the dividing point between the esophagus. The proximal two thirds or superior two thirds, this is the anatomy of it. Right. Notice it has a very similar anatomy to what we saw in our alimentary canal, where we have a mucosa, we have a submucosa, we have a muscularis. Esophagus, remember, is one of our sad puckers, so it is retroperitoneal. So notice on the outer surface, it does not have a serosa. It has an adventatia, and they didn't bother to write that for us there, so we'll write it for them. Advent. On its outer surface, which is going to anchor it into place. Notice, though, there are a couple uh, subtle and not so subtle differences. The first is there is no muscu uh, mucosa, muscularis mucosa. There is no smooth muscle layer distinguishing between the submucosa and the mucosa. It is a mucous membrane. We still have a lamina propria that is in a real art connective tissue that is part of the mucous membrane. But notice when we look at the epithelial tissue of our mucosa, even at a low magnification like this, we can tell that it is not a simple columnar. Instead, it is a non-keratinized stratified squamous. This changes abruptly about two thirds of the way down the esophagus. Two thirds of the way down the esophagus, there is a transition, an abrupt transition, where the tissue uh, instantly changes from a non-keratinized stratified squamous to a simple columnar. It's actually really beautiful when it occurs. I, don't, I didn't bother getting a slide for it now, but I will show it to you on Friday. I guarantee I'll have a slide where it shows that. Uh, and it's really actually really cool. Uh, the slide I usually use in the classroom is actually a mouse slide. And what's cool about the mouse slide is the mouse slide, the transition actually occurs at the stomach. The entire esophagus is a non-keratinized stratified squamous, and then the stomach, it becomes simple columnar. And so not only can we see the transition, but we can also see the valve between the esophagus and the stomach as well. So it's very, very cool that way. I'll see if I can find a similar picture online to be able to show us that. Uh, we're much bigger, and so for whatever reason, our transition occurs about two thirds of the way down the esophagus. So here we see the anatomy of that. The other important thing, and this is gonna be an important thing we'll talk about a lot uh, as we work our way through the alimentary canal, is again, our alimentary canal is essentially comprised of a bunch of hollow tubes that are connected together. And one of the important things to remember is we want to control the movement of substances as they work their way through the alimentary canal. So many, I would even say most, of the organs of the alimentary canal are going to have enlargements of the circular layers of their, uh, of their muscularis at the beginnings and the ends of these organs to form valve-like structures to regulate the flow through them. And of course, what do we call those valve-like structures? Sphincters. Sphincters, there you go. For the esophagus, the one basically where it is associated with the larynx and the pharynx is called the upper esophageal. Um, is that going to fit in there? I think it will. Oops, what happened? Oops. Deal. There. There you go. Can you guys see all of that? Can you see the L? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the upper esophageal sphincter is the opening at the top. At the bottom, not surprisingly, it is called the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. It is also sometimes referred to the cardio, cardioesophageal. All right, isn't cardio associated with the heart? 
Yeah, but it turns out the proximal part of the stomach, because of its proximity to the heart, is known as the cardial region of the heart, or it is also known as the gastro. gastroesophageal sphincter, uh, because it's the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach. So all of those are acceptable in terms for the lower sphincter of the esophagus. And again, this anatomy where our hollow organs are bounded by valves on both sides is something that we're going to consistently see in our anatomy as we work our way through. All right. Questions on that. Obviously, our mouth wasn't that way, although you could argue the abicularis oris is a valve, but we really don't have a valve at the posterior part where it reaches the pharynx. Um, all right, so that is the anatomy of the esophagus. esophagus. Again, it's not super exciting, pretty simple and straightforward. And like we said, the top third of it, so for top two thirds of it, like I said, is going to be uh, that non keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, uh, whereas the bottom third is going to be that simple columnar. And like I said, it's cool. The transition is abrupt. You simply strict, uh, you know, go in one tissue and then suddenly the epithelial tissue instantly changes. It's very cool looking. And like I said, I'll show you that. I don't think I have it in the lecture here, but I will show it to you uh, on Friday. All righty. Oh, I lied. Hey, look at that. I do have it. Awesome. Notice right here, we have our non keratinized stratified squamous. And then, like I said, boom, at this point right here, instantly it changes into a simple columnar. So the transition really is that abrupt in that change on the esophagus between the anterior two thirds and or really the proximal two thirds and the distal th uh, third of the esophagus. Awesome. So there we actually do see it. Perfect. That makes me happy. All right. We'll still look at it again on Friday. All right. To finish off the oral cavity then, what we have to talk about is the process of moving the food on its mystical magical journey from the oral cavity on into the pharynx and the esophagus. Of course, that is the process that we commonly refer to as swallowing, but of course swallowing is not the appropriate anatomical term for that. So we will learn the process of deglutition. Deglutition is the process of moving our food along the alimentary canal from our um, oral cavity into the rest of our alimentary canal. This is a partially uh, voluntary process, I will say. Uh, it starts with a voluntary action, uh, similar to the one we see here in the illustration. Uh, where using the tongue, we present our bolus to the posterior part of the oral cavity. And that triggers what is a subconscious reflex, right? There are two implications to that. The first is it is subconscious, so it isn't swallowing, isn't truly a voluntary act. You may have experienced this for yourself if you're sucking on a hard candy moving it around your mouth and it accidentally too, goes too far back in your oral cavity. Maybe you're getting ready to speak or talk or anticipating something. And if it goes too far back, it can actually uh, trigger that swallow reflex and you swallow it even though you didn't mean to, right? The other important significance of the fact that this is a subconscious reflex is now that we're all at home all the time where most of us are drinking heavily, and if your loved ones or your you know, 10 year old daughter or whatever passes out drunk, the best thing to do is not to pour coffee down their throat, right? Because if you are unconscious, you are not capable of producing a subconscious reflex. And so instead what you'll be doing is pouring that piping hot coffee into their lungs, which I promise you will wake them up, but is not necessarily a good thing to do, all right? So this process of deglutition is an elaborate process. There are over 22 muscles 
of the throat and neck that are involved in this process. You're not gonna have to name all of them, uh, but I just want you to appreciate that it is an elaborate process. And this process, as the illustration shows, occurs in about three, not about, it occurs in three phases. So let's talk about those three phases. And those three phases are basically defined by where the food is during this process. Uh, hold on, uh, there's a question. On the gross anatomy list for the esophagus, there is the esophageal hiatus uh, of the diaphragm. Uh, yes, I can show you where that is. Um, I don't know how. Hold on, give me one second. That is an excellent question. Uh, for that though, I need to go back to 431. Perfect. Uh, pardon me, 430. You guys are 431. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean 430, you learned about the muscles. And one of the muscles we're looking at here from an inferior view is the diaphragm. Way back on the very first day of 430, we learned that the diaphragm was an anatomical divider that separates the ventral body cavity into the thoracic body cavity and the abdominal pelvic body cavity. Right? Then in the muscular system, we talked about how it plays a curved muscle and change its shape. We just talked about that a lot, its function in maintaining our normal uh, resting breathing rate, our eupnea, um, uh, for, uh, for our respiratory system. But we do have this issue where there are some structures that need to get from the thoracic cavity to the abdominal pelvic cavity. So while it is an anatomical barrier, Notice there has to be an opening in it for the aorta to pass through. There has to be an opening in it for the inferior vena cava to pass through. And there has to be an opening in the diaphragm for the esophagus to get from the, through the thoracic cavity into the abdominal pelvic cavity and get to the stomach. And so here is the esophagus passing through the diaphragm and this opening in the diaphragm that the esophagus is passing through is the esophageal hiatus. So basically the esophageal hiatus, the hiatus is an opening, a passageway through the diaphragm uh, so that food can get from our, uh, from our uh, oral cavity into our stomach. Great question. All righty. See, and now we're all nostalgic for 4.30. We missed that and how much more easier it was and how much more fun it was than all this horrible stuff we're having to do in 431. Okay, maybe not, but, but maybe so, who knows? All right, excellent. Uh, so there's that, there's that. So that was a great question. Uh, let me bring back up the people and my annotations. Excellent, all right. So no, actually I wasn't, I don't think that was necessarily on the list of things to show, but that's a great question. And so I'm glad you asked that. All right, any other questions? All right, so as we mentioned, uh, this is a subconscious reflex that is started with a voluntary act, really two voluntary acts. Well, okay, really three voluntary acts. Voluntary act one, putting food in your oral cavity, right, ingestion. Voluntary act two, chewing that food the 30 times you're supposed to chew it before swallowing that food down, right? The process of mastication uh, aids in the mechanical digestion of our food. It also uh, works to mix the food with our saliva. And remember, when we mix our food with the saliva, we form that magical material we call a bolus, right? Anyone who's ever had a sibling, right, has taken that last strip of bacon, thrown it in their mouth, and started chewing right away, and then when their younger sibling starts complaining, you gleefully spit it out into your hand and offer it back to them, right? It is no longer bacon, it is now a bolus, and in most cases, your younger sibling won't take it. Sometimes they'll take it out of spite, but they certainly aren't gonna eat it, right? So that mixing of the food forms that bolus. 
And so those are all of the voluntary acts. The third voluntary act is then using the tongue to present that bolus to the posterior part of the oral cavity, right? So we form that, uh, that bolus and we present it to the posterior part of the oral cavity towards the oral pharynx. When this occurs, basically there are two key things that occur in the uh, buccal phase. Well, I guess technically three. The first is obviously the presentation of the food towards the posterior part of the oral cavity. But when that bolus is moved to the posterior part of the oral cavity, it basically does two things. The first thing it does, and we see a little bit of this in the illustration here, is that it elevates the soft palate and the uvula, right? We talked about the hard palate made up of the palatine process of the left and right maxillary bones and the horizontal process of the left and right palatine bones. They form that hard bony roof of the mouth. But we do have connective tissues and other materials that form what we call the soft palate. And that soft palate tapers to that dangly thing in the back of the throat, which is the uvula. When that bolus is presented to the posterior part, it elevates the soft palate and the uvula. And when it elevates the soft palate and the uvula, basically what it does is it closes off the nasopharynx. And that ensures that food is not going to uh, elevate into the nasal cavity, right? We want the food going down, so we need to limit the options of where it can go. And so that soft palate is gonna close off the nasal pharynx and stop the food from going in that direction. The other thing that is going to occur, and this is why when that, uh, you get that hard candy that goes too far back and you accidentally swallow it, is the bolus comes in contact with the arches. Remember this illustration doesn't show up, but we have those two arches, the palatoglossal arch and the palatopharyngeal arch. And when the bolus, the food comes in contact with those arches, that is what triggers the reflex, right? All reflexes need a stimulus and it is the stimulation of those arches by the bolus, by the bolus that triggers our reflex here. And so those are the two big events that are going to occur as a result of that voluntary act, hopefully voluntary act, of presenting the food to the posterior part of the oral cavity. And that is our buccal phase. Let's go ahead and clear that. So again, it closes the soft palate. And as I mentioned, it is going to come in contact with those pharyngeal arches, the glosso, uh, the, the glossopharyngeal and the glosso, uh, pardon me, the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal arches. That contact with the arches triggers what we call the pharyngeal phase. The pharyngeal phase is again a reflex. It is a subconscious reflex that is controlled by the medulla oblongata. And this is something you can all experience for yourself. Put your hand on your throat and swallow. And when you put your hand on your throat and swallow, what you should feel is that enlarged uh, anterior portion of the larynx, that laryngeal prominence of the thyroid, a cartilage, you should feel it elevate and come back down again. And that's essentially what the swallow reflex is. During that part, the beginning of it, or the pharyngeal phase of the uh, deglutition, what happens is that our uh, larynx elevates. When the larynx elevates, we feel our Adam's apple go up. And again, that elevation of the larynx leads to two important events. Uh, and you can see them actually both in the illustration to our right here. 
the first thing that occurs when the larynx elevates is if you notice, as the larynx elevates, that elastic cartilage epiglottis folds over the top of the larynx and closes the glottis. This, again, remember, our goal is to limit the options of where our food can go. Notice our soft palate closed off the nasal pharynx. Now the elevation of the larynx bends the epiglottis down and stops the food from going into our larynx and into the trachea and the rest of our air passageway. But remember, we also talked about how there's this upper esophageal sphincter. The other thing that happens when the larynx elevates is when the larynx elevates, it also opens the upper esophageal sphincter. And when we open the esophageal sphincter, notice we've been limiting where food could go. It can't go into the nasopharynx, it can't go into the larynx, but now by relaxing, by opening that sphincter, our food now has a passageway into the esophagus. And so that is the key to the pharyngeal phase, right? Our larynx elevates, that closes the epiglottis, and it opens our upper esophageal sphincter and allows the food to enter into the esophagus. And of course, once the food is in the esophagus, we enter the esophageal phase. Again, remember, these phases are named by where the food is, not necessarily the events that are going on. In the esophageal phase, as you hopefully felt when you put your hand on your throat, our larynx, or let's, uh, uh, yeah, our larynx depresses back to its original position. When that occurs, not surprisingly, two things occur with it. Uh, the first is that when it depresses, our epiglottis opens and our airway is open again. All right now that we're done swallowing, we want to be able to breathe. I'm not sure why I used two for that. And the second thing that it's gonna go, as you can see by the arrows that are there, as the larynx uh, descends, it closes the upper esophageal sphincter. And now the food is not capable of coming back up into our air passageway. Our food is happily in, closed up in our esophagus. And of course, once in the esophagus, peristalsis is going to move that food down the esophagus and eventually into the stomach. So again, esophageal phase, contraction of the pharyngeal muscles, the bolus enters the esophagus, and then our larynx descends, our esophageal sphincter closes, and our uh, epiglottis opens back up. Would you mind going back to this? I'm sorry? I said, would you mind going back to the slide that you were just Uh, That one? Was this the one you wanted? No, like uh, the pink writing, the pink oh, that you're uh, writing. Ooh. Uh, that? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So again, the key to uh, the esophageal phase, oops, there we go, is that the larynx descends, that descension of the larynx causes two events. Really the opposite of what it did when it went up. When it went up, it closed the epiglottis and opened the esophagus. So when it goes back down, it does the opposite. It opens the esophagus, it, uh, pardon me, it opens the epiglottis and closes the esophagus.
And once the bolus is in our esophagus, then peristalsis carries it down to the stomach. All right, did you get what you needed? Yes, thank you. Awesome. All righty, so let's go ahead and clear that again. And again, emphasize that, bing, bing, bong. And here we see it uh, traveling via peristalsis down the esophagus, uh, where it will eventually enter the stomach. And again, it needs to pass through that lower esophageal or gastroesophageal or cardioesophageal sphincter. Again, if we've learned anything, anatomists hate us and they love to give a thousand names to the exact same thing. Uh, and this valve down here, this enlargement of the circular muscle layer has basically three names. And here we open that lower esophageal sphincter and our food, you know, several seconds after we have swallowed it, is now reaching the stomach. And that is the process of deglutition. All righty, any questions on that? All right, as I mentioned from here, we have entered into the esophagus. But really, and let's write this because I want to make sure we have it. Esophagus is a conduit. Any idea what I mean by conduit? I think we've used that term before. We talked about it, for instance, in our blood vessels. Our blood vessels, well, our arteries and veins were conduits. What did that mean? It just moves the bolus from one place to another. It doesn't do any absorption. Absolutely. The esophagus really has only one function. The only function of the esophagus is propulsion. It does not process the food in any way. There is no mechanical digestion, no chemical digestion, no absorption, obviously ingestion and defecation, right? None of these things are occurring within our esophagus. Its sole function is propulsion getting the food from the oral cavity, really from the pharynx, into the stomach in a few seconds. Uh, and that is really its only function. It does nothing else. All right. So because we have the basic anatomy, because we know it uses peristalsis to move things, we're really done with our esophagus at this point. And so from here, we can move to a much more interesting, if somewhat overrated, organ in the stomach. All right. Now, I know I haven't lectured for as long, but we did spend the first 20 minutes or so talking about the exams and the game plan. And this is a good natural stopping point. So let's, we've got a lot of material to cover today. So let's go ahead and for take our first break here. Uh, any questions before we uh, start the stomach? So anything on the esophagus, anything on the pharynx or the oral cavity uh, or deglutition for that matter before we move on to this? I do. Yes. So Monday, you were saying um, about how the the enzymes in your mouth, how they can start breaking down in, chemically. Um, so how does that work compared to? I know that you said the esophagus is just a conduit, but does that have? Does it start breaking down and start absorbing into the mouth at that point into the bloodstream, or how does that work? So great question. So yes, uh, again. It, as we talked about, if you were to take a piece of bread and put it on your tongue and let it sit there for a while, your uh, saliva would mix with it. The salivary amylase in your saliva would start the process of breaking it down, and you would start to actually taste some of the sweetness of, that, uh, of those simple sugars from the breakdown of those carbohydrates in your mouth. You wouldn't necessarily absorb them, but they would mix with the saliva, and they would stimulate your taste receptors, and so you would be aware of them there. Uh, remember, we also produce the lingual lip base and mix it with it, but it is inactive at that point. It won't be active until it reaches the stomach. There are some other things like water, some medications, uh, some simple fatty acids, some lipid soluble things like alcohol. There are some limited things that can be absorbed in our oral cavity, but they aren't things that necessarily have to be broken down. They're just things that, that if are already simple in their format, they can, be they can be absorbed in the oral cavity. However, again, if you think about how long a bite of food is in your mouth for, certainly while some chemical digestion of carbohydrates can start, 
in the oral cavity. It is not the primary location where that is going to occur. So it starts there, but it's just really assisting. It's just starting. It's the very beginning of the process. I'll, 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 I'll spoil it for you right now. Uh, the vast majority of all of the uh, chemical digestion that takes place, the primary location where that occurs in the small intestine. A little bit can start in the oral cavity, a little bit can start in the stomach, but the majority of all of our uh, chemical digestion occurs in the small intestine. The small intestine is the true rock star of our digestive system, and it's where most of the stuff occurs. All right? Technically, if you produce salivary amylase to mix with a piece of bread, and that piece of bread is being moved down your esophagus, I guess theoretically that enzyme could be breaking down those carbohydrates on its journey. But if you think about it, the esophagus didn't produce those enzymes. It isn't doing anything to help or assist the process. So it really wouldn't be considered responsible for it. And it's in the esophagus for such a short period of time that certainly we wouldn't consider any uh, chemical digestion of being, uh, that occurred in there as being the responsibility of the esophagus. And no, there isn't any absorption, any meaningful absorption that takes place in the esophagus. So it really is just a conduit. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Great question. Any others? I love you guys. You guys are so much more fun than my 430 class. I swear I could be just recording these by myself with them. They just sit there like bumps on the log. I have to like refuse to talk for 30 seconds before someone will finally, you know, answer one of my questions. You guys are much more really interactive and I just want you guys to know how much I appreciate that. Uh, this teaching online is brutal and you guys definitely make it worthwhile. So I greatly appreciate that. So thank you for that. All righty. Uh, with that then, um, it is 9.06. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. That means coming back at 9.16 and at 9.16 we will restart and I will also uh, start the recording at that time as well. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. Uh, go get a beer, I mean a coffee, and I will meet you guys back here in 10 minutes. <clears throat> back to it. All right, so our goal now is to move on to the stomach. When we look and talk about the gross anatomy of the stomach, there are some key characteristics we want to be able to identify and distinguish. Uh, for starters, as we have talked about, there is going to be uh, valves, sphincters, that are going to uh, regulate movement into and out of the stomach. So again, here at the um, proximal end, oops, no, that like that, there is that upper esophageal sphincter that is going to regulate the movement of materials into the stomach. And at the distal end, we have this big and large uh, thickness of the muscular wall, circular layer of the muscular wall, the muscularis, and that is the pyloric sphincter. Uh, that pyloric sphincter is one of the largest, one of the strongest in the uh, body <clears throat> because the forces that are produced by the stomach are very strong as well. And so we want to be able to limit and regulate. Uh, you may have back in ancient times, if you remember back in 430 when we did our organ system overview, we were actually able to palpate the stomach and the uh, pyloric sphincter of the stomach of our cadaver. And it was a big, huge, massive muscular structure. Uh, the uh, stomach itself is comprised of four distinct regions. Uh, as I mentioned, the proximal part uh, is what is known as the cardia or cardial region. Uh, this is the part that is basically fed into by the esophagus. So let's go ahead and draw a line to kind of separate this. So the cardia is kind of this part right here. Um, just the proximal part, and again, it's close proximity to the heart. The inferred pain that comes with it is often why when we have an upset stomach, we refer to it as having heartburn. So the cardia that is that there. Uh, we then have uh, a, um, a big, huge, and large region known as the fundus. 
Uh, the fundus is this big, huge, and large patch, uh, a pouch-like portion of the stomach that is kind of superior here on the side. Uh, we also have a specialized funnel-shaped region. So if you notice basically around right here, uh, we have our uh, pyloric region, kind of goes through, the, the pyloric antrum is kind of the passageway into it. It's this, we don't have to worry about distinguishing that, but basically it is this uh, more muscularized and as we'll see the glands in it are slightly different in the pyloric region than it is from the fundus and the remaining, which is the body. So we have four distinct regions. We have our cardia, our fundus, our body, and our pylorus. Those are the three, uh, uh, pardon me, the four gross anatomy regions. We've identified the two valves. The other, well, there are two big specializations also to the stomach. Uh, the first we can see here when we look at the anatomy of the muscularis. And we look at the anatomy of the muscularis, we see there's not one, not two, but three layers to the muscularis externum. This is the only organ of the alimentary canal that has more than two. As we said, the basic anatomy is two. We have the closest to the lumen circular, the furthest from the lumen, the longitudinal. And here we can see the circular is indeed going around the circumference of the organ. The longitudinal is running the length of it. But what the stomach has that the other um, organs of the alimentary canal don't, and it's one of the things that histologically makes it really easy to distinguish, is that it has an oblique layer. It has a third layer. The oblique layer is the one that is closest to the lumen. And as oblique indicates, it goes at an angle. Of course, the advantage of a third layer is it gives us more motility to our stomach. Our stomach ca can combine both circular and longitudinal and I'll now oblique contractions of these fascicles to twist and turn and essentially what we call churn our bolus here in our stomach. All right, and again, the same way you can chew something and spit it out and that bolus looks different from the food that went in, someone has the ability to swallow food down into their stomach and uh, regurgitate it back out or babies often you know, drink their milk and then get gas in there and if you don't burp them properly, they can spit that up as well. And notice when it comes out, it looks different than when it did in the mouth. And the reason for this is here in the stomach, is where our food undergoes its second iteration, its second change, that food became bolus in the mouth, but here in the stomach with the, sterni with the churning of the stomach and more importantly, with the mixing of the food with our gastric juices that we'll talk about, we form what is known as chyme. So here in the stomach, we form our second iteration of the food, really third, I guess, food is its first iteration, then it becomes a bolus, now in here it becomes the chyme. And here that chyme is formed, and again, it is that churning of the stomach uh, that mixes it with the um, uh, gastric juices, but also continues the mechanical digestion as well. Right, as I mentioned, I know everybody in this class chews their food the 30 times you're supposed to chew it before you swallow it down, but some people take a bite of food chew it twice, and then down the gullet it goes. When that's the case, right, luckily our stomach is able to assist in that process. And like I said, the stomach does tend to have a rock star status. If you randomly grab someone on the street, which legally you're not allowed to do anymore, but back in ancient times when you could, and you ask them to identify an organ in their digestive system, most people will say stomach. And the stomach is an important organ in the alimentary canal. It does a lot of things to assist in the processing of our food in our alimentary canal. But that's really the key. It really is just an assister. It just assists in this process, right? There are many people who have um, stomach stapling where they, you know, cut, they limit 
movement through large portions of their stomach or will boot banding type of activities or in extreme cases if someone has uh, major ulcers or, uh, or, 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 or uh, stomach uh, tumors, the stomach could actually be removed entirely and we can essentially connect the esophagus to the small intestine and it doesn't dramatically affect the uh, function of the digestive system. It affects the volume of food that you can ingest but not so much the, the breaking down of it. In fact, as we will learn, there is only one thing that our stomach does that is vital for the function of your body that you cannot live without. And it's not what you think it is. So it plays an important role in processing the food, prepping the food, storing the food. It is a huge important organ for assisting in those things, but it's not vital. There's only one vital function that it has. And we'll get to what that is in just a minute. All righty. Uh, so let's go ahead and clear that. We've talked about the basic anatomy. Let's talk a little bit more. Oh, actually, I'm not alive. There's, there's one more thing that I want to talk about. Uh, notice as you look on the inside, there are all these folds, right? Right around the corner of the 4th of July. And who knows what we'll be doing on the 4th of July. But for many, many years, the greatest sporting event in the history of mankind occurs on the 4th of July. And what, of course, is that mystical, magical uh, sporting event, greatest of all sporting events that occurs on the 4th of July? The hot dog eating contest. There you go. Nathan's hot dog eating contest. Joey Chestnut is going to reign supreme, hopefully again, for his eighth straight year or something crazy like that, eating 70 hot dogs in 12 minutes of time or whatever crazy thing he is able to do. And obviously that's a massive amount of food to put into this organ and they have to train specially to be able to do that. Hopefully you can't fit 70 hot dogs into your stomach. But if you think about that third serving of pumpkin pie that you had on Thanksgiving, obviously your stomach has a good ability to be able to expand. And a lot of that expansion comes from these big, huge folds on the inner wall, the inner surface of our stomach. We know uh, muscle has elasticity, has the ability to stretch without being damaged. And here, and here's the key, it is a portion of both the mucosa and submucosa. Uh, there are folds of both the mucosa and submucosa together uh, that form these big, huge ridges known as the rugae. And these rugae are what basically allow it to expand. So again, notice, and I want to emphasize this, notice here, they say it's the rugae of the mucosa. But one of the important things to remember is the rugae involve both the mucosa and the submucosa. They're big, huge, massive invaginations. And the way I always think of it is if, right, back in ancient times, you used to be able to go shopping at supermarkets. And the biggest concern about shop shopping at supermarkets is you had to bring your own bags. So you would take your plastic bag from the last time you went shopping and you would crumple it up into a ball. So it took up much less space. If you were to then cut it in half, right, what you would see is all these huge folds of that collapsed bag. And those folds of the collapsed bag are what allow you to expand it to accommodate all of your, uh, all of your groceries. And that's basically what these rugae are. These rugae are the folds of the stomach that are able to expand to accommodate Thanksgiving. Right, or all the snacking that you're doing while you're quarantined at home. But there are other specializations at, on the microscopic level. While we looked at the gross anatomy and see some differences, there are also some major differences in the microscopic anatomy of our stomach as well. And again, these are ma major invaginations, but these major invaginations, oh, I need to move this out of my way. These are major invaginations of the mucosa only. Remember, the rugae involve the mucosa and the submucosa. They're big, huge, bulging uh, uh, portions that make up of both of them. However, in our mucosa only, we halt have these invaginations, uh, basically what we call the gastric pits. Oops, I don't know where I'm writing this. Oh, there it is, I'm running it there. That's not where that belongs. In the mucosa only, we have our gastric pits. And within those gastric pits, we have our gastric glands. 
So notice here, we see these invaginations that are coming down through this. These are our gastric pits, and these gastric pits are the openings to where we have our specialized cells, and those specialized cells form the gastric glands. So again, if we uh, cheat, we can do something like this. Basically from, there we go. Here up is our gastric pits, the invaginations in only the mucosa. Notice we can tell that because right here we see the muscularis mucosa. So we know the mucosa is everything up from there and our submucosa is beneath it. But this space that we've done, drawn in between is the location of our specialized gastric glands. And this gastric gland is lined by specialized cells that they're the responsibility of producing the gastric juice. Um, now, when we talk about the cells that line the, um, the mucosa, line the surface, and line the gastric pits, these are primarily uh, what we call mucus cells. And guess what mucus cells uh, produce? Mucin. Mucin, absolutely, excellent. They produce mucin, that protein that when hydrated becomes mucus. However, they produce a very thick, a very sticky, and a very um, alkaline mucus. Right? And the reason for that is because we need to protect the wall of our stomach, right? As we know, one of the major components of our gastric juice is hydrochloric acid. And cells of our body don't like hydrochloric acid or hydrochloric acid don't like the cells of our body, however you want to think of it. So we need to protect these cells from that, uh, from the chemical digestion, from the other things that are going on. And so we have this thick, viscous, sticky, alkaline mucus that helps to coat the inner surface of our stomach and to protect it, right? If this protection thins or weakens or if we overproduce acid, uh, then what can happen is the wall of our uh, stomach can start to break down on the inside. And what do we call that condition? Ulcer. Ulcer, ulcer. yeah, ulceration, absolutely. We can get ulcers and if that ulcer ulcerates deep enough down to the blood vessels, it can actually bleed and can cause serious issues. Absolutely, so we need to protect the surface. And so the majority of the cells that line the surface, the majority of the cells that line the gastric pits are these mucus producing cells. Oops, I hope I spelled mucus correctly. These mucus producing cells. Uh, these mucus cells that produce that thick alkaline mucus. However, in our gastric pit, we have four specialized cells that we are going to need to be able to identify. So let's go ahead and clear this picture and move to the next part of our lecture. Here we get a closer look. Um, um, at one of these uh, gastric pits and gastric glands. As we mentioned here, the outer cells are aligning the surface and lining the gastric pits are our mucus cells. But down here inside the gastric gland, we can see uh, by color, right? There's pink, there's blue, there's purple, and there's green. And of course, those aren't the real colors of them. Uh, but um, those are four specialized cells that we need to be able to identify. Uh, what I will tell you is that uh, we, when we look at the illustrations of them, there are some characteristics about them that make them distinct. So I would expect you to be able to identify them in an illustration like this. Technically, it is possible to distinguish them histologically, but when we're looking at them under the microscope, it is much more challenging. So I will not ask you, and I will not show you a histology slide, point at a blue cell like this and say, what is this cell? But typically the illustrations or the models that show them uh, emphasize some of the physiological differences, whether it's either location or their shape and size. So in a model or an illustration like this, I would expect you to be able to distinguish them. So let's identify these cells. As we talked about, 
lining the surface, lining the pit, we have those mucus cells or goblet cells producing that sticky alkaline mucus. And those line the surface and line the gastric pits. However, in the gastric glands, we have, as we see here, four unique cells. So notice, let's emphasize this. These four cells are the four cells that are found in our gastric pit, pardon me, our gastric gland. And the one, these four cells found in our gastric gland, well, sort of, these cells form our gastric juice. And again, like I said last time, like I will continue to say, it varies based on the number of times you eat, the volume of the food you eat, and the composition of the food you eat. All of those factors can dramatically change how much gastric juice you produce, but a nice, simple, sky is blue, global uh, average is one and a half liters of gastric juice during the course of a day. Now let's talk about these four cells. Uh, the first are the parietal cells. These parietal cells are the largest. They tend to have this kind of uh, open shape. Notice they almost kind of look like, I don't know, like some kind of weird Klingon starfighter or something like that, where they have this very unique shape with these large invaginations to them. It's this kind of triangular shape with the large invaginations. Notice if we go back to the previous picture here, it's got that kind of fork-like appearance to it as well. So we can see those are the blue cells uh, that they're pointing at here. And these uh, parietal cells tend to be uh, more uh, intermediate in their location. So notice they're going to be intermixed. And I think, and I think the previous picture shows this nicer. So let's actually go back to there real fast. Uh, come on. That's what I want. So as I mentioned, there are four cells. We have the parietal cells, as we can see here. These are the ones that are represented in blue. We have the chief cells. These are the ones that tend to be more intermediate in their location. We then have the mucus neck cells. And even though they have the pink coming way down, I would say the mucus neck cells are more proximal, more superficial, closer to the top. And the green cells down here at the bottom are what are known as the enteroendocrine cells or the G cells. And these are uh, endocrine cells that are responsible for producing hormones. Oops, wrong direction. So let's identify now and look at these here. Parietal cells are intermediate in their location. And as I mentioned, they have that three-pronged appearance that is very distinct and makes it very obvious and easy to identify on any model or illustration. And they are responsible for producing the hydrochloric acid. One of the things we talked about is that the um, pH of the stomach is between one and two pH. And a large reason for that is the large amount of hydrochloric acid that is produced by these parietal cells, right? What does hydrochloric acid do? Down the food. Say again? break down, it changes the pH that so breaks it all down into like more of a mush? True, it does play a role. And again, but remember, when we're thinking of breakdown, we need to think of, uh, when we're thinking of our breakdown, do we mean a chemical breakdown or mechanical breakdown, right? And remember the difference is, is it change the shape or does it break bonds? It's going to be a chemical because it's gonna activate that salivary lipase. Ah, but if it's activating the salivary lipase, then it's the lipase that is providing the chemical breakdown. It's not actually the hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid may be what turns it on, but the hydrochloric acid isn't actually producing the chemical breakdown, but you have the key. It changes the shape of the lipase. It changes the shape of proteins in general. Proteins are highly sensitive to uh, pH changes, not that it breaks the bonds between the amino acids, but it changes the shape, it changes the relationship of those hydrogen bonds. And so if it unfolds the piece of paper, it's not changing the composition of the paper, but it plays a huge role in the mechanical digestion of proteins, right? Uh, lipids, carbohydrates don't have that same sensitivity to pH. 
Uh, so you're right, it is going to, and we can actually put that under here. It will facilitate uh, some, some uh, chemical uh, breakdown uh, by activating our lingual lipase and by activating something else that we'll get to in just a second. But again, this is the, the huge key to this is this is indirect. So I wouldn't call that a function of the hydrochloric acid. Indirectly, it is going to assist in those things, uh, but it's not an actual function. So what are some of the other functions uh, of hydrochloric acid? So again, as you mentioned, it activates the enzymes, plural, right? Lipase and another one. But what's the other function of hydrochloric acid that you know about? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, months ago, whatever it was now. What's the other advantage of having a big acidy stomach? It uh, works with the immune system to break down any pathogens. Yeah, it provides protection. Absolutely. It provides protection from pathogens. Most harmful pathogens that you're inhaling, uh, right, with your food or your drink that comes to your digestive system is going to be broken down and denatured by that acidic environment. So it's definitely providing a protection as well. So again, super useful in its functions that way. But like I said, not necessarily vital. Important, but not vital. In fact, as I mentioned, there is only one thing that our stomach does that is vital for your survival as an organism. And it happens to be these parietal cells that do it. The parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid, but they also produce another substance as well. And the other substance they produce is what is known as intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is a hormone-like protein. It is a protein uh, that kind of acts like a hormone, but it's not truly a hormone. And what intrinsic factor does, and again, primarily in the large intestine, intrinsic factor allows you to absorb vitamin B12. What this means is that uh, you could take a whole, you know, bottle full of B12 vitamins. If your body is, if your stomach is not producing that intrinsic factor, your digestive system is not going to be able to absorb that B12. And it turns out B12 is really important because B12 is needed to produce red blood cells. If you remember, the red blood cells you have only last for about 100 days. We are literally producing millions of them, you know, every hour to replace the millions of them as we're losing every hour. So it is a, a vitally important function to be able to produce red blood cells. And if we don't have B12, we can't produce red blood cells. So those people we talked about who um, uh, have to have their stomachs removed for ulcers or cancers or something along those lines are taking intravenous B12 injections as a result of that. They can't take a, a, a dietary supplement because they won't be able to absorb it because they don't have that intrinsic factor. So they have to be taking intravenous injections of B12 uh, to compensate that for that to make sure that they're getting enough B12 uh, to be able to meet their needs. And that is the only vital thing that your stomach does that you cannot live without. All right, questions on that? All right, so like I said, not what you would think, but it is vitally important. The second, and again, these are more intermediate cells. Oh, can I bring that all back? There we go. Let's just erase this one. Uh, a second intermediate cell. So found in the middle of our um, of our gastric gland are the chief cells. Chief cells uh, tend to be smaller, more triangular in shape, as we can see here, and they produce an inactive enzyme known as pepsinogen. 
pepsinogen when active or when activated becomes oops, pepsin. And aside from being the arch rival of Coca-Cola, what does pepsin do for us? No one? Really? Does it break down amino acids? Exactly. Uh, well, more specifically, it breaks down proteins into amino acids. Absolutely. Pepsin is a vital enzyme in the breakdown of proteins. So remember, we talked about where our digestion of our macromolecules begins. Remember, carbohydrates, it started in the mouth. Here in the stomach, we get the start of lipids with that lingual lipase. And here in the stomach, we also get the beginning of our breakdowns of proteins with that pepsin. Pepsin is the Pac-Man that is going to break the bonds. And notice hydrochloric acid unfolds the proteins, make it easier for that enzyme to get in there and break those bonds. Now, notice this enzyme is produced in an inactive state as pepsinogen. All right. And that's probably important because if you think about it, one of the things the chief cells is probably chock filled with is proteins. And do we necessarily want this pepsinogen breaking down uh, the proteins of the chief cells? No, we want to break down that cheeseburger you had for breakfast. And so one of the first things that happens when this pepsinogen is being released is that hydrochloric acid and that acidic environment is able to actually activate the pepsinogen. It can activate a small amount of that pepsinogen. And once activated, it can then activate more pepsin. So the hydrochloric acid kind of changes the shape of some of it so that it can become active and then it breaks down more. So the more pepsinogen we have and the more hydrochloric acid we have, the more active pepsin we can get as a result of that. And I think I have a pretty picture that shows this. Here we go. So, and we'll go back to what I was doing in a second. So here is that three-pronged parietal cell producing the hydrochloric acid. That hydrochloric acid helps to facilitate the activation of pepsinogen into pepsin. And then pepsin can obviously activate even more pepsinogen. So we have lots of pepsin for the lots of breakdown of lots of, um, for lots of uh, breakdown of lots of proteins inside of our stomach. All right. Now, as it turns out, uh, producing pepsinogen is not the only thing the chief cells do. It is an important enzyme, but it turns out in, and I guess I have to move that out of the way now. Uh, I have no place to put this, so we'll just sneak it in here. Um, in infants, it also, these chief cells also produce two important enzymes, and they are renin and gastric lipase. Renin and gastric lipase uh, play an important role in breaking down milk fats and milk sugars. And why might it be useful in an infant to have enzymes that break down milk fats and milk sugars? Uh, there you go, because that's their primary diet. Absolutely. Babies get milk, and so these things help to break them down. One of the things that literally happens to all of us as we age is that we all lose our tolerance to drinking milk. Now, we have, uh, I would dare say, and use the magical dreaded word, evolved as a species to be able to tolerate milk for a much longer period of time than most organisms are able to. Most organisms that are weaned on milk, once they're done being weaned on milk, they're not able to get viable nutrients from it. Uh, we have been able to sustain uh, that to, uh, and to a fashion, but it is somewhat limited and we do see a decrease. So typically one of the things that happens to us as we age is we become less and less tolerant to milk uh, as a result of that, but uh, certainly are more so when we are infants. All right, 
questions on those two? So those are the two intermediate cells. Let's talk about the ones at the top and talk about the ones at the bottom. At the top of our gastric gland, so if you notice right up here at the very top of our gastric gland, are some very interesting cells known as mucus neck cells. Again, these mucus neck cells are not the same thing as the mucus cells. Mucus cells, remember, as we talked about, uh, the ones up here at the top, these ones up here at the top, or lining uh, the pit produce that thick, sticky alkaline, right, basic uh, mucus, or really mucin that becomes mucus, is being produced here. What's interesting about these mucus neck cells is the acid that, uh, pardon me, the mucus that is produced by them is actually acidic. The function of these are not fully understood, although there is some strong speculation. It is believed that there is two advantages of having this acid, acidic, uh, acidic mucus near the top of our gastric gland. The first, as we just talked about, is it can play a role in the activation of pepsin, because after all, as we talked about, we have to change the pH of that pepsinogen uh, to be able to get it to uh, be able to become active and break our proteins down. But remember also, up here, we're producing all this thick, all this viscous, all this alkaline sticky mucus and we wanna make sure that our gland doesn't get congested. So it is also believed that this acidic mucus may help to uh, maintain uh, the opening of the gastric gland. By producing a more acidic uh, mucus, it may help to maintain this opening and keep it from getting congested, keep that sticky mucus from clogging up uh, the gland. So again, it's not fully understood what it's doing, but it is believed uh, that it plays a role in those two parts. All right. And that leaves us with our last cell. The last cell are these that are, so and again, emphasize these are superficial in the gland. And these are the ones that are the deepest cells in the gland. In fact, they're deep because their goal is to produce a hormone. That hormone is gastrin. Gastrin is a major excitatory hormone. And being a hormone, that makes these enteroendocrine cells, as the name indicates, endocrine glands, Remember, even a single cell can be an endocrine gland, and that's what we have here. We have basically, and that's right, the, just to emphasize that. This is a single-celled endocrine gland. And as such, endocrine glands do not release their secretions outside of the body. So this gastrin is actually produced, and this is why it's deep in the gland, because the goal of it isn't to release it into the gastric gland and add as part of the gastric juice, but instead, whoa, that's huge. Um, I don't like that. There we go. Its goal is actually to release that gastrin into the interstitial fluid. So this releases into the humors. And of course, once it's in the interstitial fluid, it is going to go into the blood. And of course, once it's in the blood, it can go everywhere. And that everywhere majorly includes the stomach because gastrin is one of the major uh, excitatory hormones of our stomach. So it makes sense that these are in the base. Right? And so really, they don't contribute to the gastric juice but they are part of the gastric gland producing a hormone and releasing that hormone into the interstitial fluid. I need to release that. So we can, oh, oh, and then it went away. All right, I guess that was it. So I guess I didn't have to erase that. 
All right. So there you go. There is the microscopic anatomy of our gastric gland, the cells, and what those cells do. Questions on that? All righty. Excellent. Now that we have the anatomy, we can start talking about the physiology of the stomach. When we talk about the physiology of the stomach, right, as we talked about, it is going to cause the second iteration, the second change in our food, mixing that bolus with that gastric juice. And as such, it is going to produce our chyme. With that third layer of smooth muscle, that oblique layer, it is able to uh, produce much more complicated contractions leading to the churning of the food. Because like I said, not everybody necessarily chews their food the 45 times they're supposed to before they swallow it down. So uh, we can help to churn to continue that mechanical digestion uh, within there. Obviously, that churning also mixes it with the enzymes, uh, both the activated pepsin that is released from the gastric gland, but also that lingual lipase that was released uh, by our uh, uh, tongue, but now is becoming active. And so that secretion of the hydrochloric acid helps to activate those enzymes. The enzyme that is released and secreted uh, helps in the chemical digestion of food. So again, protein digestion begins via, and we already said it, pepsin. Fat digestion begins via the lingual lipase. And I can go ahead and write it there just for the fun of it. Pepsin, lingual lipase. Oops, why did that not work? There we go. Uh, that is occurring there. Uh, there is also some uh, hydrochloric acid that we talked about. Uh, protection and the activation. And again, remember uh, this hydrochloric acid release also it, you could argue is part of the mechanical digestion that is taking place in here. Because again, for proteins, the hydrochloric acid uh, denatures the proteins, which basically unfolds them and that unfolding of them, part of the mechanical digestion, makes it easier for enzymes to break the bonds. Again, remember, hydrochloric acid does not break bonds. It is not chemical digestion. But it does unfold the paper, unfold the enzymes, making it easier to get in there and make the cuts that are necessary. So it takes that big globular protein and spreads it out so that it's easier for the enzymes to get in there and do their job. And then we talked about the mucus cells, both the uh, mucus cells uh, that are lining the surface, producing that protective alkaline sticky mucus, and those mucus next cells producing an acidic uh, mucus, uh, probably to help to keep that gastric gland open. There is some limited absorption that occurs uh, within the stomach. Again, if you think about it, it isn't a major site for absorption, even though the food could be in there for a while. Uh, with that thick, viscous uh, mucus on the surface, it is harder for nutrients to get to the wall and be absorbed. So it's not gonna be able to have as much contact. Uh, but there are some things that can be absorbed in the stomach. Water, and interestingly enough, cold water uh, is absorbed much more rapidly in the stomach than uh, warm water is, or room temperature water. Why that is, is not fully, as, as, our, as far as I know, is not understood. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, so again, if you just got done with that nice long run and you're all sweaty and dehydrated, cold water is absorbed much more rapidly by your stomach than room temperature or warm water is. So have a nice glass of cold water. Uh, and again, electrolytes too, so even better have a cold Gatorade rather than a hot cup of coffee. 
uh, some short chain fatty acids, uh, alcohol and aspirin, some other medications, things along those lines uh, can be absorbed by the stomach as well. That's why, again, when you're going out or back in the ancient times, when you were able to go out to the bar, right, you, know, you did much better for the evening if you had that nice big meal first, rather than if you just went in on an empty stomach and had your four shots of Jägermeister, uh, then uh, you are going to absorb that alcohol much more readily and uh, uh, you're going to be hurting as a result of that. Now, as we mentioned, the goal of the stomach is to churn and be able to uh, chemically, pardon me, uh, continue the mechanical breakdown of our food. However, the other function, and this is really where that pyloric sphincter comes in, the other function of the stomach and the reason it has a valve at the distal end is to present that food to the small intestine. Right. If you think about it, it's important that our stomach has two valves, one at the proximal end. And again, that point of the proximal end is to provide protection for the esophagus. The esophagus does not produce the thick uh, alkaline mucus the way the stomach does. So if you overfill your stomach or there's too much acid, uh, one of the things that can happen is irritation can cause an opening of that cardioesophageal sphincter or a weakening of that uh, from excessive uh, uh, filling or excessive ac acidity can actually cause some of that chyme to start to move back into, uh, the, into the esophagus. And what do we typically call that process of that chyme moving back into the esophagus? Vomiting. True, if it were too fully uh, uh, MS, then that would be the case, absolutely. But no, you can still, uh, you can get s some expression of that acid into the esophagus without actually causing a regurgitation to occur. And what would we call that? Acid reflux. Acid reflux, absolutely. That acid reflux is that weakening of that cardioesophageal sphincter and the expression of some of that acidity into the esophagus. <clears throat> Chronic acid reflux can lead to esophageal um, ulcers because again, it doesn't have that protection from the uh, acid the same way that our stomach does. But the other valve, the pyloric valve, plays an important role in the presenting of the food to the small intestine. As I mentioned, the small intestine is the true rock star of the digestive system, and where all, the majority of all of the uh, important digestive functions occur in the small intestine. But if you think about it, when we were looking at the kidneys, Right, making filtrate is good, but making more isn't necessarily better. We need time to process it. And the same thing is true here in the small intestine. The small intestine is you know, great at what it does, but it also needs time to process things fully and efficiently. And so the other function of the stomach is to slowly present the chyme to the small intestine in a small and measured and, me and metered uh, uh, ability. One of the things we talked about at the last class is even if your stomach is quote unquote empty, there are still some basic waves of smooth muscle contractions some peristaltic waves that occur in your stomach. They occur at a rate of about three per minute. Uh, the reason for this is if you think way back to 4.30, one of the things we talked about is that in some rare instances, smooth muscle can also be autorhythmic, like our cardiac muscle can be. And here is the example of really where that occurs. There are some special cells, uh, pacemaker cells, found in the stomach in part of its enteric plexus, that elaborate plexus we talked about. So we have that enteric plexus. and more specifically in the myoteric oops, a branch of the enteric plexus, there are these special pacemaker cells called the cells of Cajal, because good old neuroanatomist uh, Ramon uh, Y. Cajal, who is, was a, a, an amazing, amazing, uh, some of the books that have been written about him, one of the most amazing neuroanatomists uh, ever in the history of all of mankind, quite a character. Uh, but he was one of those people who uh, loved the microscope, was a beautiful artist. And so he would look at the microscope and draw these things and of course plant his flag in it and call them all after himself. But there are these special pacemaker cells called the cells of Cajal 
uh, that produce a basic electrical rhythm of the heart, uh, pardon me, of the stomach, uh, like the heart does, where it would produce these mild peristaltic waves at a rate of about three per minute. However, as we talked about, when you have that cheeseburger for breakfast, it stretches the stomach. That stretch stimulus uh, triggers a reflex in that enteric plexus, and we get an increase in the strength, an increase in the rate of these contractions to churn the food and also to present the food to our small intestine. As I mentioned, the pylorus is specialized in, and actually it's specialized in a couple ways. Uh, the first is that it has a thicker muscular wall. It's one of the ways we're going to be able to distinguish it from the fundus and the, uh, and the, uh, and the body. We're not gonna distinguish the fundus and the body, although it's possible, but you are responsible for distinguishing uh, the fundus from the pylorus. The pylorus is a thicker muscular wall. It also, uh, and again, we'll do this more when we look at it histologically, there's more mucus cells in the pylorus, whereas there's more uh, parietal cells and chief cells in the fundus. And the job of it is to grease this area and use this muscular funnel, which is essentially what the pylorus is, to produce these vigorous peristaltic contractions that basically really churn the food and are able to present a small amount of the chyme to the small intestine while then reverberating the rest of it back to be mixed with the rest of the food. And I think we have a pretty picture from your textbook uh, that shows this. Oh, I think I have it at the end of this. Um, so yeah, so we will see that and talk about that process. All right, perfect, excellent. All right, again, depends on the composition of the food, the volume of the food and how frequently you eat. But on average with a typical meal, uh, it takes your stomach about two to four hours to empty. All righty, questions on that. All right, now that we've talked about some of the physiology, we need to talk about how it is going to be controlled. I know when you first look at this illustration from your textbook, it can be a bit intimidating. Uh, but, uh, and again, we'll take a break to, uh, to cleanse the palate, pun intended, uh, before we start this. But one of the points that I want to emphasize is, as you can see from what it says here, we are talking specifically about the regulation of gastric activity. We are regulating the activity of the stomach. One of the important things to remember, oh, now that I've done that, I need to clear that so that I can do that. Gastric activity. We are solely talking about the regulation of the stomach. Will some of the things that we talk about influence other organs and get other organs to do things? Yes, absolutely. Do we care about it when we're talking about the regulation of gastric activity? Absolutely no, we do not. We are going to talk about our three regulatory mechanisms. And again, if you think about it, these three regulatory mechanisms, as you can see by the names, are basically dictated by where the food is. Notice we start regulating the activity of the stomach before the food even hits our stomach. In the cephalic phase, when we're tasting it or smelling it or looking at it or even thinking about it, right? Then we are going to regulate the stomach when food is actually in it. And then when the food is presented to the small intestine, the small intestine is going to have some say on what the stomach is doing as well, because the stomach is presenting it to the small intestine, and so the small intestine wants to uh, control that. So again, the key to these processes is that uh, the three mechanisms are dictated by where the food is. We are only controlling the stomach right now. Again, will some of these factors, some of these, uh, these uh, these uh, mechanisms influence other organs? Absolutely. But we're not focusing on that right now. We're just focusing on gastric activity. And as you can also see from this illustration, there are going to be for all of them, both uh, excitatory and inhibitory 
mechanisms that are possible where we could both increase or decrease the activity of the stomach at all stages of this process. All right, so that's gonna take a, that's gonna be a lot to take in. So like I said, this is another good breaking point. Uh, my watch or clock says 10.08. So uh, let us return at 10.18. And at that part, I will restart the recording. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, so go stretch, take a quick power nap, whatever it is you need to do. Uh, be back here in 10 minutes and we will talk about control of the stomach. Onward and upward. <clears throat> So, like I said, we are now going to focus on control of the stomach, the regulation of gastric activity. And as we talked about, this occurs in three phases. And those phases are determined by where the food is located. It starts in this phallic phase. And again, the key to this phallic phase, if we're gonna define this phallic phase, is this is before the food reaches the stomach. What that means is that uh, the food could be inside or outside of the alimentary canal. All right, it could technically be in your mouth where you are tasting it and chewing it. That certainly would be capable of stimulating the stomach to be active. But it could also be the smelling of the food or the seeing of the food or the hearing of the sizzle of the food. Or like I said, even just closing your eyes and thinking about that great Carl's Jr. commercial or something along those, those lines. This cephalic phase is obviously based on the fact that the food hasn't reached the stomach yet, it is going to be a neural control, under neural control. And of course, if we're talking about under neural control, uh, we are talking about both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic pathways, right? Again, normally we think, you know, good old rest and digest, parasympathetic uh, is the primary we think of, and it is the primary for the excitatory pathway. Like I said, that sizzle of that meat, that smell of that, uh, you know, burning on the grill, the view of that meat is all exciting and excitatory and stimulating unless you're a vegetarian. If you're a vegetarian, then the smell of that red meat, the look of those juices, right, the smell of that burning flesh is definitely not excitatory for them. In that case, it would be the sympathetic pathway that would be inhibitory. All right, <clears throat> and that's really the other key to the cephalic phase. The goal, if you think about it in simple terms, uh, the goal of this, and maybe I can sneak it in here because my guess is that it's not, right, is basically to get it ready, right? Uh, we'll do it in fancy terms, prime the pump, right? Our goal is to get the stomach ready for activity, and typically the thought, the see, the smell, the taste of the food does that unless you don't like meat, then it doesn't. Or like I said, maybe it's uh, you know your loved one carrying that big beautiful tray of prime rib uh, to you across the lawn because they just finished it on the barbecue and rested it and sliced it. And as they're bringing it, they trip and drop it and that prime rib, rib fi uh, falls on a big pile of dog poop, right? We think of it as normally being excitatory, but it can be inhibitory as well, right? If you're that little kid being forced to eat that mushroom that you hate, uh, the sight of that mushroom, the, the sight of your parent trying to shove it into your mouth, obviously is going to have a very negative, a very inhibitory effect on your digestive function, and especially the, the, the cephalic phase, the stomach, as a result of that. And so that's really the key with the cephalic phase. The goal is to get it ready, but it can obviously work in both directions. So like I said, this is gonna be before the food hits the stomach, 
it is going to be initiated by some type of sense receptors in your head, uh, whether it is taste, uh, whether it is smell, uh, whether it is uh, the sight of it. And uh, this is as good a time as any because it's in the head to think of it in terms of the cranial nerves. If it is the sight of the food, which cranial nerve is responsible for uh, carrying that information in again? Two. Cranial nerve two, excellent. If it is the smell, uh, which cranial nerve would that be? One. There you go. If it was the taste, which cranial nerve would that be? Nine. Uh, nine does provide, so I would say nine indirectly. Uh, nine does provide some chemo reception uh, uh, in our pharynx and other areas like that. We have, uh, so like acidity, uh, you know, uh, basic pHs or amino acids or things like that. But what's the one that's responsible for taste on the anterior two thirds of the tongue? So nine is definitely a correct, a correct answer, but what's the other one? Glossopharyngeal. Well, that is nine. Oh, sorry. The other one that gives us taste. Anyone remember? Facial. Okay. Facial, remember, also gives us that taste from the anterior two thirds. Remember, it is one of our mixed nerves, uh, both sensory and motor in its function. And so both seven and nine will play a role in providing that information. And then of course, obviously there's all of the cognitive information, all of our thinking and if we're thinking about it, then really it's going to be that vagus nerve uh, 10 that is going to be carrying that information uh, to, the, uh, to the stomach to stimulate it. So it's going to be those cranial nerves coming. Uh, and again, this is all coming from the head. And that's why this is called the cephalic phase. All right. And like I said, the goal is to get the stomach ready. So it is going to start uh, the production of uh, gastric juice. It's gonna increase the activity of our gastric juice in our stomach, and it is also going to increase the motility. And remember, as we talked about, these factors can influence other organ systems as well. One of the classic examples of this is when you see or you smell or you think about the food, right? This can stimulate um, saliva production, increasing the amount of saliva that you produce as a result of that. So again, the point to emphasis is that these stimuli can influence other things, but that's not our focus right now. Our focus of gastric activity is on the stomach. So yes, it's going to make our mouth salivate. Other uh, effects are going to occur as well, but our function, our concern right now is instead on what happens in the stomach. And in the stomach, that is going to be, whoops, an increase in the secretions uh, and an increase in motility and anticipation of the food. All righty. I think that one's hopefully fairly intuitive. Any questions on that? I think the second phase is fairly intuitive as well. And that is our gastric phase. Again, here in the gastric phase, uh, the food is in the stomach. So the food is in the stomach. And obviously, if the food is in the stomach, then our goal is to process it. All right? Yeah, we had to trick that baby into, uh, you know, open the tunnel and let the plane come in to get it down, or you had to hold down that three-year-old to shove the mushroom in their mouth and right, pinch their nose so that they can't breathe till they swallow it down, right? And they're, uh, you know, and, or whatever it is, right? Or you're that vegetarian, you're right, pretending it's a, a, an impossible burger or whatever it is, you know, whatever, whatever it is trick that you have to do to get that food in, once we get that food into the stomach, whether you really wanted it there or not, the goal of the stomach is going to be to process it. So like it says here, it, this process, this stage of it is primarily excitatory. When food is in the stomach, the stomach needs to deal with it. And that's gonna be an excitatory process. However, in times of major stress, if you really had to 
restrain that five-year-old and hold them down. And like I said, pinch their nose so they couldn't breathe. So to force them to swallow their stomach, can that amount of stress uh, inhibit what's happening inside of your stomach? Absolutely. Um, uh, if the stomach gets too acidic, uh, that can cause problems. If the stomach gets too full, that can cause problems. In times of stress or pH or overfilling or those types, in some instances, uh, it can be inhibitory. And as many of you who have kids know, if it becomes too inhibitory, the stomach is too full, too acidic, there's too much stress, then what ends up happening is you get a reverse peristalsis. Uh, and with that reverse peristalsis, you get right, regurgitation. You get vomiting as a result of that. So with extreme stress, with an extreme inhibition, you can actually get a reverse peristalsis of the stomach, which would cause a, a release of that material, that regurgitation of the material. But again, under normal circumstances, under normal functions, even if it isn't your favorite food, right? You may not be a fan of red bell peppers, but if there's three of them in your you know, big bowl of soup that you're eating and one of them gets swallowed down, may it not be your favorite thing, when it gets down to your stomach, right? Your stomach is going to be excitatory and active in the uh, breakdown of it. Now, this excitatory process, is something of a positive feedback process. Uh, it's a limited positive feedback, but uh, we'll see the idea here where again, we have some type of stimulation of the stomach. Again, uh, there is going to be, because here the food reaches the stomach. So whether it is the pH of the food, uh, the presence maybe of some of those simple sugars from the breakdown of the carbohydrates in your mouth, a certain fatty acids, or simply the stretch of the stomach from a large bolus of food getting down there. When the food reaches the stomach, it stimulates the stomach. And basically with this local stimulation, we get a local response. That local response, and again, this all uses that enteric plexus, so this is part of that short reflex, right, that local intrinsic reflex. Uh, as we talked about, the stretch of the stomach basically causes two things to occur. We get an increase in the muscle contractions and the power of the contractions, so there are more and they're stronger. And, oh, I should say, let's do this also. Oh, why does it not say that there? Uh, the other thing that occurs is that it increases the activity of the gastric glands. This is important for two reasons. The first reason this is important is that obviously we produce our gastric juice or continue, because remember this started in this phallic, produce our gastric juice uh, that is gonna help in the digestion of the food. But also, we are going to produce gastrin. Gastrin, remember, is our hormone. And that hormone is going to get into the blood once it gets into the blood, it is going to affect a lot of things, but one of the main targets of the of gastrin, so let's move this out of the way. One of the main targets of gastrin is the stomach. And so gastrin in the stomach increases the motility, and it increases a uh, gland production. 
right? So like I said, you can see how this is kind of a positive feedback. Stretching the stomach causes the stomach to produce gastrin, which causes the stomach to contract more and produce more glandular secretions, which produces more gastrin, which stimulates the stomach even more. And in this process, we get this continuation. Notice also with this production of gastrin, our gastric phase is both, and I've kind of ran out of rooms to put it here, so I'll sneak it in right here. It is both uh, neural and hormonal. All right, remember our cephalic phase is all neural. Here, our gastric phase is both, and let's change the color of that to really emphasize it. Our gastric phase is both neural and hormonal. With the help of gastrin, we get a hormonal component uh, to this as well. All right. And again, as we talked about, oops, depending on the uh, content of the food, the volume of the food, the composition of the food, the frequency of eating, anywhere two to four, three to four hours. Uh, for uh, to empty the stomach. So the stomach's active for about three to four hours as a result of this. But there's one more thing that our stomach is doing during this time. While it's having this increase in the muscle contractions, as we talked about, we start producing those more powerful contractions those more powerful contractions in the pylorus. And that pylorus is going to start to express through the pyloric sphincter, that food into the small intestine. All right, and that, once the food enters the small intestine, is when we start the intestinal phase. So any questions on the gastric phase before we move to the intestinal phase? Yeah, the increase in motility, does that just mean like increasing the food to go towards the pyloric region? Uh, both, as we'll see. And again, I thought I had the picture earlier, but we will, uh, I promise you, we will see it uh, in a few moments. Uh, what happens is that the, uh, there is an increase in the overall activity of the stomach. We get more churning. And again, mm -hmm. that churning is going to help to mechanically break down the food but it also mixes it with the enzymes to help to facilitate the chemical digestion. And it is also going to produce powerful uh, contractions to express that food into the small intestine as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and as I said, this phase, the gastric phase, as we talked about, and I, know I, I apologize because I know I wrote a lot of things on here and it doesn't say it, but again, I wanna emphasize that here our gastric phase uh, is both neural and hormonal. Right? We still have those local cues, the stretch, that short intrinsic reflex that is going to stimulate activity. But part of that activity that is stimulated is the release of gastrin. And that gastrin is going to stimulate glandular secretion and motility of the muscle cells as well. So it is both. So cephalic is just neural, but gastric is both neural and hormonal. Great questions. Any others? All right, excellent then. Then let us move on to our third phase, the intestinal phase. The intestinal phase, as we talked about, is going to occur or starts when the food is presented to the small intestine. All right? It's not when the stomach empties. It starts when the food is first presented uh, to the small intestine, all right? As we said, our small intestine is where the major processing of our food takes place. So in this case, our goal is not to get the food as quickly as possible into the small intestine, but our goal is to control the rate of food to the small intestine. Uh, so we can maximize the efficiency. So again, the food is in the small intestine, but our goal is still to control the stomach. 
right? We want to control the stomach and we want to control uh, the rate of the food as it leaves the stomach into the small intestine. Now, as you can see from the pretty illustration, and I'll make sure to emphasize this here, this is both uh, neural and hormonal. And I spelled neural wrong, but hopefully you guys get what I mean both neural and hormonal. And uh, there's one interesting thing. I know it's about to say it here in a second here, but remember we talked about how uh, cephalic phase, and again, uh, I'm gonna cheat and write this right here and then I'll write it again. Cephalic, remember we talked about was either positive or negative, right? One or the other. You either like meat or you don't like meat. So it's either positive or negative, right? We talked about how the um, gastric, or the stomach phase, is primarily positive, all right? Yes, there are extreme circumstances where it can be negative, but the goal is primarily for it to be positive. Here, the key with our intestinal phase is the intestinal phase is both excitatory and inhibitory. Now, again, obviously it doesn't make sense that it could be both at the same time because then they would cancel each other out. So as it talks, so as we will say, and again, it's gonna emphasize this as we go over it in just a second, it is excitatory first for a brief period of time and then it becomes more inhibitory uh, for longer control. So I need to get rid of that one uh, and then we can continue on. So again, this intestinal phase, we now have our chyme, it's being formed and we want to present that chyme to a small intestine. And like I said, it is going to be first, very briefly excitatory in nature, and then it is going to be inhibitory. And here in our intestinal phase, we are going to, again, use both neural and hormonal controls. So let's divide this intestinal phase up into these two steps, starting first talking about this excitatory stage. Again, this is what happens first, and it is brief. And it starts when the food is first presented, and let's emphasize that word again. When the chyme is first presented to the small intestine, the small intestine produces a hormone called gastrin. Well, doesn't that sound exactly like the hormone that is produced by the stomach? Yeah because it is the exact same hormone, right? If you think about it in the endocrine system, we talked about how androgens could be produced both in our adrenal gland and in our gonads, right? And while it is a different cell in the small intestine that produces the gastrin than the cell in the uh, stomach, once that gastrin gets in the blood supply, starts circulating and going to the target cells, do the cells care where that gastrin came from? So sometimes in the, um, in the textbooks and, and, and things along those lines, you'll hear them talk about, you know, uh, gastrin and intestinal gastrin. But really, intestinal gastrin is gastrin. They're the exact same molecule. There's really no difference. And so when it hits that target cell, the target cell doesn't care where that gastrin came from. And so as we know, gastrin is excitatory to the stomach. It is going to increase motility and increase secretions. And so, as soon as the small intestine produces that gastrin and releases it into the blood supply, we get a immediate uh, but brief increase in the activity of the stomach. Small, it's like the small intestines going, oh, hey, there's food in the stomach. All right, come on, get that stuff moving. Let's get this on the line so we can start processing. 
And so we get this uh, brief excitation to increase the motility, increase the presentation of that chyme to the small intestine. But, and so notice also this excitatory, so let's emphasize this as well. This excitatory is controlled hormonally only. So our excitatory, which is first and brief, is solely controlled by hormones and more specifically, solely controlled by gastrin. But gastrin isn't the only hormone that is going to be produced uh, by the small intestine. And as you can see from the pretty illustration, our intestinal phase, the inhibition is controlled by both uh, neural control and by hormones. Now, I don't remember exactly how I have this displayed on the slide, so let's go ahead and write it out first just to make sure. Let's talk about neural control first. As food is presented uh, to the small intestine, uh, the small intestine is stretched. Or like we talked about, there can be uh, the presence of chemicals or even the osmolarity of the chyme can uh, signal a, you know, either a chemoreceptor or an osmoreceptor or a, a mechanical receptor can stimulate a neural reflex. And really, more specifically, it stimulates two neural reflexes, kind of came together. These combined neural reflexes are what are known as, and you can see it here on the screen, the enterogastric reflex. And it basically does two things. The first thing it does is it suppresses the uh, parasympathetic, nervous system input. So we get less neural stimulation to the stomach. So it's going, to it's going to suppress the parasympathetic nervous system input to the stomach. And obviously the parasympathetic excites the stomach. So this will of course inhibit the stomach if that occurs. And the second thing you, it does, as you can see uh, from the illustration here, is it uh, inhibits the myenteric plexus. And of course, if you inhibit the myenteric plexus, you are going to decrease the motility of the stomach. And if you decrease the motility of the stomach, it slows the presentation of um, chyme to the small intestine. So again, via that stretch, via those chemoreceptors or osmoreceptors, we are going to get this neural control. Put that there. This neural control uh, that is going to um, I hear that they don't like that. There, there. Uh, that is going to, in two ways, slow down the activity of the stomach. It's going to suppress the parasympathetic nervous system, inhibiting all the activity of the of the stomach, and it is going to directly uh, suppress activation of the myenteric plexus. And remember, the myenteric plexus is what controls the smooth muscle. So it's gonna slow the rhythm down of the stomach. So there are fewer contractions and with fewer contractions, less uh, chyme is going to be presented to the small intestine. All righty. Secondly, we are also going to produce hormones. 
Now, notice with our neural control, it can be something as simple as the stretch or the osmolarity or something like this. So this neural control, and let's change the color to emphasize this, is a more general, is a more general control, right? All right, stomach, you're presenting food to me. I need time to process the food. So you need to slow things down a little bit so I have times to process it properly. The hormones, though, are going to be much more specific. There are dozens of enteroendocrine cells uh, in the small intestine. And what hormone they produce is solely determined by the composition of the food. If a lot of lipids are present, it's gonna produce something like cholecystokinin. If a lot of acidity is present, it may uh, produce something like secretin. If a lot of carbohydrates are present, it may produce something like gastric inhibitory peptidase, right? What hormone is produced is much more specific and it's much more selective. But in general, as you can see, all of these hormones, so again, and I'll emphasize it over here, in general, and we're gonna list some of the hormones. There are dozens. I'm gonna give you a very small select list to be specific to. I see there's a question, give me a second and I'll get to it in just a moment. Uh, in general, all the hormones have an inhibitory effect on the stomach. Now, again, all of these hormones are going to have other effects as well, and we'll worry about those other effects later. But for right now, when we're just focusing on the control of the stomach, pretty much all of the hormones that we're going to talk about that can be produced are going to inhibit. Uh, the stomach. And notice it can inhibit both secretion and uh, motion. All right, what was the question? So, is the enterogastric reflex the first neural reflex or the second? Uh, what is the name? Uh, actually, it's both. So, um, this reflex is called the enterogastric reflex, and it really does two things. The two things that it does is it has more of a a uh, long or extrinsic effect, if we think of it that way, right? It has, oh, no, I don't want to use that again. Let's switch to green. It has an extrinsic, actually, I guess technically they're both extrinsic, uh, but this one's extrinsic in the fact that it goes through and influences the central nervous system. Technically, this one, we can kind of call it intrinsic because it is inside the digestive system. Technically, when we think of intrinsic, it's the same organ, but it's right next door. So we can cheat and think of it as, as a short reflex because it is contained within the digestive system. But both of these, both the long and the short effects of them uh, collectively are known as the enterogastric reflex. So I apologize if that wasn't clear. Thank you for asking that. All right, I like that. I'm gonna take a picture of this screen so that we can put that on the, cause again, I don't honestly don't remember what I have written here. So let me uh, go ahead and save this cause I like this. And then uh, we'll go through all the pretty pictures. So save that, screen saved, perfect. And now I can bring back up on my windows, that one and that one. Oops, there we go, perfect, excellent. All righty, and then now let's go ahead and clear all of this and uh, go through all the pretty words here. So again, it involves that enterogastric reflex as we talked about. It is going to both inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system, but also inhibit the local reflexes as well. So again, there's two components to that enterogastric reflex. One is more of the long reflex where we're suppressing vagus, uh, but it is also going to have kind of a short intrinsic reflex effect 
where within the digestive system, it stops uh, the motility of that. And by definition, if you're inhibiting the sympathetic, you're kind of stimulating the, uh, pardon me, if you're inhibiting the parasympathetic, you're kind of stimulating the sympathetic as well. Or you're just really increasing the intensity. If you're lowering the level of one, then the other one uh, raises uh, uh, by default as a result of it in relation to it. But like I said, also, it is going to stimulate the release of hormones. Oops. Oh, and I see I didn't write it here. That's why I wanted to write it. And again, uh, this is going to be determined uh, by the composition of the food. We're going to talk about the hormones in more depth in just a moment, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that we emphasize this. So this inhibitory effect uh, from the hormonal standpoint is going to be more specific, whereas the, um, whereas the uh, neural Inhibition, inhibition is more general, things like stretch or general, or you know, general composition of the food. Whereas here, it's going to be much more specific, where we're going to get specific hormones. But pretty much regardless of the hormone produced, it inhibits the stomach, which again is what we are focusing on right now. We'll talk about in more detail what specific hormones are produced and what the stimulus for that hormone is and its more general effects. But for right now, when we're talking about intestinal phase, pretty much any hormone you produce here with the exception of gastrin inhibits the stomach. All right, and so notice if we go ahead and clear that now and look at that, what seemed at first like a scary chart, we can now see that it makes much more sense. Here we see again, uh, our neural controls, seeing or thinking about the food or even tasting or smelling it if it's in our alimentary canal. We get that parasympathetic, uh, we get that uh, stimulation, increasing of the activity of the heart. But again, if it's something that you don't like or you're uh, depressed or you're stressed, then you can get that sympathetic uh, that depresses the activity. During the gastric phase, Again, this is where we get uh, that local reflex, where we're getting that stimulation from the food in here, causing it, and it is primarily positive. Although, like I said, if you're emotionally upset because you had to be restrained to have that mushroom forced into your mouth, or uh, that's very, very acidic in your stomach, which stress can often cause, or over full, uh, that can cause a, uh, a, a decrease in the activity. Notice both of these are either or. You're one or the other. You're one or the other. Right? And hopefully, in most cases, you're excitatory in both of these. But remember, our intestinal phase is both. Right? And that's really the key to this. This one is both. First, it is excitatory briefly with that release of the intestinal gastrin. And again, intestinal gastrin is the exact same as other gastrin. They're just emphasizing it's come from a different point, but the stomach doesn't care where the gastrin came from. It affects it the same. But then we have our neural and our hormonal control uh, that is going to decrease the activity and slow the rate at which the food is presented to the small intestine. All righty. Questions on that? Excellent. So here's the picture I keep promising you. Here is our propulsion in the stomach. Again, our goal of the stomach is to, yes, churn, yes, start the breakdown of the, um, of the lipids, yes, start the breakdown of the proteins, right? That is going to be some of the things that it does to help. But like I also said, you would survive just fine without a stomach except for that intrinsic factor. So really when it comes to the digestive system, really the important goal of the stomach is how it presents the food to the small intestine, or really the chyme at this point, to the small intestine so that the small intestine can process it. It is going to chemically and mechanically break down the food. This especially occurs in the pylorus, which is a much more muscular region. It's a small region. The pylorus only contains about 30 milliliters of chyme. So the majority of the chyme, especially depending on how large of a meal you have, is filling the stomach. But we have this small region in here 
this funnel-shaped pylorus with a big thick muscle and a small funnel-shaped uh, space to it. But as these big powerful contractions work their way down, those powerful contractions uh, force the pyloric sphincter open in a small amount, only about 10%, which equals about three milliliters. Only about three milliliters of chyme is expressed into the duodenum, the beginning part of our small intestine, with each wave. All righty, questions on that? Oh, I lost my chat window, bring that back up. There we go, excellent. All righty. From there, we are done with the stomach. I know we have some histology, but like I said, I'll cover that on Friday. So with the presentation of our food to our small intestine, we can talk about our small intestine. Now, again, remember, as we talked about in that cadaver, our alimentary canal is a hollow tube from mouth to anus that is 30 feet long. 20 of those 30 feet are your small intestine. So how the hell is anything that is 20 feet long called small? Well, it's called small because it is small in diameter and it's simply that simple. But the small intestine is our longest and our most important digestive organ. It is the site where uh, the majority of the important digestive functions take place. Most of the chemical breakdown takes place, most of the absorption takes place here in our small intestine. The small intestine is divided up into three regions. Once again, it is a hollow tube, and that hollow tube is going to have valves at both ends. At the proximal end, as we just talked about, we have the pyloric sphincter which is the valve that regulates the flow of food from the stomach into the small intestine. At the distal end, we have a sphincter that is known as the ileocecal valve. Why it is not the ileocecal sphincter? My only guess is because anatomists hate you. But this particular sphincter, this particular valve is known as the ileocecal valve, and it is called that because it is between the distal part of the small intestine, known as the ileum, and the proximal part of the large intestine, that is the cecum. So it is the valve between the ileum and the cecum, it is the ileocecal valve. As I just hinted at, the small intestine is divided into three regions. The first portion of it, uh, only making up about 5%, it is only about 10 inches in length, and that's actually what it name means. A duodenum or duodenum, both are appropriate uh, pronunciations. And quite frankly, I don't care how you pronounce it as long as you spell it correctly. But the duodenum is only about 10 inches in length. And that actually means, duodenum means 10 fingers, because that is its length. Remember also, uh, the duodenum is also the portion of the small intestine that is retroperitoneal. Whereas the other two parts, the middle part, which is the jejunum, and the distal part, which is the ileum, making up the largest part of it, uh, are both intraperitoneal. So both of these two are intraperitoneal. And of course, that's significant because the jejunum and ileum will be lined on the outer surface by a serosa whereas the duodenum is lined on the outer surface by an adventitia. So one important thing to remember when we're looking at these things histologically. Uh, one of the points that I will emphasize right here, and we'll talk about it briefly when we go through the lecture, you are going to be responsible for distinguishing the regions of the small intestine histologically. Not so much on an illustration like this, although there are some ways we can do it, uh, clearly, this part right here is the duodenum, or at least the beginning of it where it connects. And this part where it connects to the cecum is clearly the ileum, right? But this part right here, can we tell with 100% certainty what portion of the small intestine that is? No, the way this thing twists and turns, it could be a part of the jejunum, it could be a part of the ileum, 
I guess if we had to guess, guess ilium, because the ilium's longer than the jejunum. But these are big, huge, massive, moving messes of, uh, of organs. So it's not like just the proximal part, just the superior part is the jejunum and just the inferior part is ilium. No, these are intertwined within each other. Uh, and so again, there's no way to tell. So we're guessing, like I said, down here, it's most likely going to be uh, the ilium. But again, that's most likely. Up here, it's most likely going to be the jejunum. Uh, but again, there's no guarantee. And over here, it's a crapshoot, anybody's guess. So I'm not going to, on a picture like this, make you be able to tell exactly what this is and what that is and what this is and what that is and so on and so forth. But histologically, absolutely. Will you need to be able to distinguish the regions of the organ histologically? Yes. It is very obvious and very clear and easy to do if you know what to look for. And so we will make a point of emphasizing that. I think we'll talk about it a little during lecture, but we'll make sure to emphasize it on Friday as well. All righty. <clears throat> as I mentioned, our small intestine is our major digestive organ. This is where we are going to complete the mechanical uh, breakdown and chemical breakdown of our food for our proteins, for our carbohydrates, for our lipids. And notice we haven't talked about our nucleic acids yet. Our nucleic acids both start and finish here in our small intestine. Remember, breakdown of our carbohydrates began in the mouth. Proteins began in the stomach. Oops. Breakdown of lipids began in the stomach. And of course, you should know what enzymes are responsible for all of that beginning of it. But nucleic acids, oh, I misspelled nucleic acid. Uh, nucleic acids start and finish entirely in the small intestine. Small intestine is also the primary organ of absorption for both all of our substances and our water. One of the common errors that people make is to think that the large intestine is the primary organ for water absorption. And that is not true. The majority of the water is absorbed in the small intestine. Why people get confused is that the large intestine doesn't do a lot. One of the major functions of the large intestine is to absorb excess water. So absorbing water in the large intestine is one of its very important functions, but it's not the primary place where it occurs, right? It's more about fine tuning, kind of like the distal convoluted tubule. It's about fine tuning the water, whereas the majority of the water is absorbed here in the small intestine. As we learned in the cardiovascular system, there is a very special blood vessel pathway. All of the veins from our, really all of our uh, alimentary canal uh, in the abdominal pelvic cavity, of course, go to that hepatic portal system. where it is going to the liver. And remember at the time we talked about how magic occurs in that liver and we're uh, gonna kind of still use that term magic, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. Take a teeny peek behind the curtain. Uh, literally, we could spend the rest of the semester talking about what the liver does, uh, but we will take a teeny peek behind the curtain to see what it is uh, that that liver does in that special uh, blood vessel pathway where we go from nutrient rich blood to nutrient appropriate blood. And not only are the three divisions of the small intestine different anatomically, they are also somewhat different in their function as well, where uh, the uh, majority, they're both highly, they're all highly specialized, and we'll see that histologically. Each have their distinct functions, and in general, uh, the majority of the absorption happens in the proximal part of the small intestine. Now, again, I don't just mean the duodenum there is a large amount of absorption that occurs in the duodenum. But remember, the duodenum is only 5% of your uh, large, in, I mean, your small intestine. So clearly, uh, it's not going to be in there long enough for a majority of the absorption to occur there. 
but there definitely is some important stuff occurring and some absorptions happening there. So a lot of it's occurring more in the uh, jejunum uh, than in the and then and, and in the duodenum than in the ileum. All righty, we saw the stomach, and the stomach had some specializations that helped in its functions. Our small intestine has some specializations that help in its functions as well. And again, this is one of those things that I think people are sometimes confused by. So I wanna make sure to emphasize this. Um, I haven't done this this way before. Actually, I haven't done anything this way before because we're teaching online. But here is our cross section of our small intestine. As you can see here, and these are a feature that can actually be observed with the naked eye. There are these large invaginations of the lumen. The lumen is not smooth. There are these large invaginations. They are similar to the rugae that we saw in the stomach. And they are similar in that they are comprised of both the mucosa oops, and the submucosa. So they are similar in that fashion, but they're different in their function. In a stomach, they're those rugae, and they are to allow for the expansion of the organ to accommodate more food. Remember, more food in the small intestine isn't as important. We're only doling it out three milliliters at a time. So these are all about surface area. And these specializations for surface area are what are known as the circular folds. Or uh, and I always like the pretty names for these things, but you don't have to use it. They're also known as the plicae uh, circularis. So circular folds or plicae circularis are both acceptable terms for this. And they are these big, huge, and now that I've done this, actually, this isn't going to work. I'm going to have to cheat and put it down here. I wasn't thinking when I did this. Excellent. And again, these are big, huge, gross anatomy things that can actually be seen in the naked eye. When, and we, again, depending on uh, when you took 430, who you took 430 with, uh, we were actually able to open up the small intestine a little bit on our cadaver, and you could actually see those folds inside of there. When you look at the models or the illustrations, you can see the folds in there. What you can't see on there is our second specialization. On the surface of these plicae circularis, there are these extensions, and these finger-like extensions that stick out run the entire surface of the plicae circularis. These finger-like extensions are extensions solely, so these are extensions, oops, I want this to be red. Extensions of the mucosa only. And these extensions of the mucosa only are these finger-like extensions that stick up, and we call these our mucosal villi. Notice here we kind of see an illustration that represents these a little better than my horrible little drawings. However, what they don't have here, and I wish they would have, uh, was to show, and let's see if they have this labeled wrong, is the muscularis, the muscularis mucosa. All right? This what we have here is not the submucosa, that is wrong. This is the lamina propria. That we have here. This is our lamina propria. And so of the mucosa, we have these enlargements of the mucosa only, these finger-like extensions that are the villi. 
And notice, and I can't use pink, uh, even though they did here. Actually, I guess I could use pink. Notice on the surface of the villi are, are epithelial tissues. Oops, it's supposed to be pink. And our epithelial cells, it's still supposed to be, I guess that is pink, wow. And if you notice on those epithelial cells, we have our microvilli. So lining the surface of our villi are our absorptive cells. So lining the surface of the villi are our absorptive cells. And of course our absorptive cells are the cells that are responsible for absorptive. These absorptive cells are our simple columnar cells. And these simple columnar cells have microvilli. So notice we have all of these specializations, three specializations, all involved in increasing surface areas. Big folds in the mucosa and submucosa, big folds of the mucosa, and big folds of our plasma membrane. Villi on the cells of the, uh, microvilli on the cells of the villi, and villi on the surface of the plicae circularis, the circular folds. Three huge uh, surface um, area enhancing specializations. And these specializations, I know I've made a little bit of a mess, so I need to move this out of the way because I think it populates right up here. Collectively, these, surf these extensions of the plasma membrane increase the surface area as much as 600 times, as opposed to if it was just a smooth singular tube. So one is a specialization of the mucosa and submucosa. One is a specialization only of the mucosa and one is a specialization of the epithelial cells. And all of these dramatically increase our surface area. The other thing that these microvilli do, even though this picture doesn't show it, they also actually house some enzymes. And these enzymes are gonna play an important role in the uh, breakdown of our foods. In fact, because they're on this microvilli brush-like, bristle-like appearance, they're actually called brush border enzymes. And so these brush border enzymes, which are a huge massive collection of enzymes, there are dozens of them. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for the individual names. You'll just need to know that embedded up in here uh, within these microvilli are all these special enzymes that are gonna help in the breakdown of our uh, food so that we can absorb it. All right. So again, these specializations slow the flow of the chyme, but they also dramatically increase the surface area so that we can increase absorption. Again, remember villi uh, are non-motile, our microvilli are non-motile. But notice our villi contains capillaries, not just blood vessel capillaries for the absorption of food, but those special long, narrow, specialized uh, lymphatic capillaries that we learned about in the back system, those lacteals. Again, these epithelial cells, because it's a major site of digestion, a major site of uh, where the chyme is coming in and the chyme is very acidic. We are constantly destroying the epithelial cells. In fact, the lifespan of an epithelial cell in your small intestine is about three days. So every three days you have a completely new epithelium in your small intestine. That means that a fair amount of the feces that comes out of your digestive system is actually those shed and destroyed epithelial cells. But the other things that means is that these cells are highly mitotic. Now, again, one of the nice things is that our cancer treatments are getting a little bit more targeted. But when people first started taking chemotherapy, 
and they still have issues with this these days when people are taking chemotherapy. Remember, chemotherapy is uh, basically a toxin that targets highly mitotic cells with the goals of it uh, destroying cancer cells. But also, often uh, people would lose their hair because the matrices of our hair follicles are highly mitotic. And often people who were taking care of chemotherapy would have major issues with their digestive system, uh, diarrhea, digestive discomfort, problems, because it would attack those highly mitotic cells as well. So like I said, every about three days, we have a completely new epithelium. All right, and again, here's the pretty picture from your textbook again. I know it's showing all the jejunum at the top, all the ileum at the bottom, but remember, it's not always like that. These are gonna be intermixed, so don't assume that it's uh, superior is jejunum and inferior is ileum. Here's some more pictures again. Notice here, we can see again, and this more appropriately shows that those plicae circularis are formed by both the mucosa and the submucosa whereas the villi are just formed by the mucosa. This shows it nicely as well. Again, here we're seeing those villi, and notice there's our muscularis mucosa. So this part up is the mucosa, and it is the mucosa that is forming uh, one of these villi, and then this whole thing would come up and form a, uh, a, a, a plicae circularis, a circular fold, and we're not seeing that there. Notice we're back to two layers to the muscularis, inner circular, outer longitudinal, and as you can see, they are perpendicular to each other. That's how we're going to be able to distinguish them. Ah, and here we see a nice plicae circularis. So again, notice it is both the mucosa and the submucosa that extend out into this big, huge, massive fold. But on that big, huge, massive fold, we have also the invaginations of just the mucosa, uh, that is the uh, villi. And then obviously on the surface of these, we have the microvilli as well. All righty. Questions on that? All right. I got to stop this for a second and take a look at where we are because I am very far behind where I wanted to be. Quick question. Yeah. Do the lacteals extend into the, the villi or do they just go into the uh, circular, plicae circularis? They solely go into the uh, villi. In the plicae circularis, you would actually have collecting vessels that would collect from that. Copy that. Uh, where are we? We are behind. Very, very behind. Um, I guess when we talk histology, I can talk more of the liver then. And so save us some time there. All right, well, it's going to be an adventure. We'll get as far as we can, and we'll see what happens. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and finish this. I did say I was going to go a little bit long today, so we will. Uh, let's finish this part of this, and then um, we'll save the liver and the pancreas for the next class. So I think that will work. All right, so... Bring that back and then share the screen again. All right. So let's briefly finish things off by talking about. So let's actually hold on. Let's go back because I like that question. Um, so, yes, notice here, and again, it doesn't emphasize it as much, but notice that these green lines here represent the lacteals. Right. If we go back to here where we saw it, the lacteal just extends into the villi. And so that's what you see here. Here in the mucosa, you have the lacteals that extend into the villi. In the submucosa would be where you'd have the collecting vessels that would collect it. So here, in, these are the collecting vessels, and then off of those collecting vessels, the lacteals would extend into the villi. 
All right, so does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. All righty, um, bring my chat back up, make sure I haven't missed any other questions. All right, perfect. All right, so let's finish this off quickly uh, by talking about our intestinal activity. Uh, again, our intestinal activity begins when food is presented to the small intestine, primarily to the duodenum. And it starts so then with that intestinal phase of the gastric activity. As we know, that causes the production of gastrin and that gastrin affects the stomach, but it also is going to have an influence on the small intestine as well. One of the things that the presentation of chyme to the small intestine does is it stimulates the production of intestinal juice. Again, depending on the number of times you eat, the volume of the food you eat, the composition of the food you eat, the amount of this intestinal juice you produce can vary, but on average, it's about two liters. And it is mostly water and bicarbonate ions, our friend bicarbonate. What does bicarbonate help us do again? The buffer. Yeah, it neutralizes acidity. Right, remember it captures hydrogen ions. Right? And remember that chyme coming in from the stomach is very acidic. So this bicarbonate is going to help to neutralize the acidity because our small intestine, we want to take the chyme and we want to rub it on the surface of the small intestine. That's how we're gonna break it down. That's how we're gonna absorb it. And so we can't have it be toxic to the tissue. So we need to uh, water it down, we need to neutralize the acidity, and our intestinal juice is gonna help us to do that. And in fact, one of the ways we're gonna recognize the uh, duodenum histo histologically is it actually has a special uh, glands that produce water and bicarbonate to help to neutralize uh, the acidity and mucus. Um, and it's also, these intestinal uh, glands are also gonna have the enteroendocrine uh, cells that will produce hormones as well. Now, stimulation of the small intestine actually begins neurally back at the cephalic phase. When we see the food or think the food or taste the food, right? Not only does the stomach need to know food is coming its way, but the small intestine needs to know food is coming its way as well because it needs to know, hey, food is on its way. Whatever you're working on right now, you need to move it along because the next load is coming through. So there is going to be some neural stimulation from there, but not surprisingly, there's going to be enteric reflexes, and then there's also going to be uh, our hormones that are going to control our small intestine as well. And like I said, one of the big differences between the small intestine and the stomach is the composition of the food matters. What is in the chyme determines what hormones are produced and how we're gonna modify behavior. Like I said, we could talk about this. Your book does a great job of talking about lots of hormones. There's over a dozen different hormones that are involved in this process, but I want to briefly talk about just a few of them. So what I'd like to talk about are some of the basic uh, stimuli and how those basic stimuli uh, of the chyme uh, affect the activity of the small intestine. We start with our stretch. Like I said, just the presentation of the chyme uh, causes mucus to be produced from our goblet cells and from those Brunner cells. The Brunner cells, as I mentioned, these are the special cells, special, sorry, glands that are found in uh, the duodenum as, as well, only. There you go, or something like that. I don't know how you spell it. It works. The first part of the small intestine. Um, oops, no, that. But like I said, composition makes a difference. If it is very protein rich, there's a lot of amino acids, then that does actually stimulate their small intestine to produce gastrin. Like we said, gastrin does stimulate the stomach to increase its activity. Proteins are much easier to break down uh, than for instance lipids are, so the speed can be a little bit faster. And it is also going to stimulate smooth muscle activity in the small intestine. So gastrin affects both the small intestine and the stomach. Gastrin though is also what releases our ileocecal valve. 
I think we talked last class about how many times with little kids, they sit down, they have a couple bites of food, and then they have to go run and go into the bathroom because they have to poop. And this is the reason for this gastrin and another uh, neural uh, cycle that will, a neuro reflex we'll talk about a little bit later is what causes this. Food hits the stomach, the stomach produces gastrin, and that gastrin relaxes the ileocecal van, valve, letting the food from the small intestine enter into the large intestine. Because like I said, we got to get the food out of the small intestine because the next load is on the way. Well, as that food enters into the large intestine, that distends the large intestine and can stimulate a defecation reflex, especially in someone like smaller, like a you know, small child. Our large intestines are large enough to handle that where you can eat a meal without instantly needing to defecate as a result of that, but it's more challenging in small kids, right? It's often the same thing with your dogs as well. Your dog has a meal and then you need to let them go outside so that they can defecate, right? The presence of lipids and certain amino acids, not all amino acids, but certain amino acids, and I'm not gonna make you know which ones, will stimulate the production of cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is one of those alphabet soup words you know you're gonna have to spell at some point or another. However, the nice thing is on an essay question, once you spell it out once, you will be able to abbreviate it CCK, and you can abbreviate that as a result of that. Lipids are much more challenging to break down than any other macromolecule, so it needs more help. And cholecystokinin is the primary hormone that helps us to do that. It does that by doing several things. One of the things cholecystokinin does is it stimulates our pancreas to produce lipases and other enzymes, but it also stimulates our liver, and it stimulates our liver to produce bile. Bile, as we'll talk about when we talk about the liver, helps us to emulsify fat. Fat emulsion is a mechanical digestion process. It is taking big globs of fat and making them little globs of fat, but it is not breaking bonds. So it is gonna help us to emulsify the fat, made it easier for the enzymes to break it down. Of course, the liver is where that bile is produced, but that bile is stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. The gallbladder stores the bile and concentrates that bile, making it much more efficient. And so we get the release of bile from the liver, production of bile in the liver, and the release of that bile from the gallbladder. And then of course we have to get it into the small intestine, and there is a special valve uh, between the pancreas and the liver and the small intestine, known as the hepatopancreatic sphincter. And cholecystokinin relaxes that sphincter to allow these enzymes to allow this bile into the small intestine to help in the breakdown of lipids. I don't remember if it says it here. It doesn't, so I will remind you of that as well. Remember, the other thing this does, this doesn't necessarily influence our intestinal activity, but because uh, fats take more work to break down, uh, cholecystokinin, as we talked about, inhibits the stomach, and it inhibits the stomach uh, to slow, and particularly inhibits the um, motility to slow the presentation of chyme to the small intestine. Oops, yep. Oops. Uh, so that the small intestine has more time to process uh, the chyme, to process those lipids. All right. Let's talk about some other examples. Uh, if there is a large amount of glucose and certain fatty acids, Again, I'm not going to hold you responsible for which ones. Uh, then our enteroendocrine cells in our small intestine produce gastric inhibitory peptide, as the name uh, would seem to indicate. Uh, obviously, one of the major functions of it is to, oh, there you go, inhibit uh, the small intestine, uh, pardon me, inhibit the stomach, in particular, inhibit the secretions of the stomach as well as the motility. But 
also, if there's a large amount of glucose in our chyme, that also means there's going to be a lot of glucose present in our blood very shortly. And if there's going to be a lot of glucose in our blood very shortly, then we need to release insulin. And where do we release that insulin from again? Pancreas. Which cells? Isini? No, not in the sinny. Remember, the sinny are the ones that produce the gas, the pancreatic juice. I remember there are alpha, beta, gamma, delta cells in that pancreatic islet. And which of those four were the ones that released insulin? Beta, beta cells. Beta cells. There you go. Excellent. So it is those beta cells in the pancreatic islets that uh, produce and release insulin. So they are stimulated um, to release insulin. So notice, remember we talked about how insulin was uh, humorally controlled by the amount of glucose in the blood? Well, if you notice, as we said, everything is more complicated than we talk about. There is actually a hormonal control of insulin as well, where we can actually get the body ready. Hey, glucose is on the way. Let's get that insulin in the blood ready to do its job. If the chyme is very acidic, as we talked about, that can be damaging to the, uh, to the small intestine. So our small intestine is going to release a hormone called secretin. Uh, secretin is going to inhibit the acid secretion in the stomach and slow down the motility. So the chyme becomes less acidic. And again, less of it is presented to the small intestine. So it's better able to be neutralized and less likely to be damaging to the small intestine. Also, it is going to stimulate the pancreas to produce more bicarbonate, right? Not so much the enzymes in this case, but to produce more bicarbonate, more mucus, uh, so that we can help to neutralize that acidity and be able to protect our small intestine. Like I said, your book has a nice table that talks about all of the different hormones, uh, what they target, what their activity is. I'm not holding you responsible for everything on this list. You don't need to know about histamine, for instance, or motilin or things like that. Just the ones briefly that we talked about. Uh, but those are the ones that I'm going to hold you responsible for. And here, if we clear the drawings, uh, you can kind of see how, uh, for instance, you know, the condition of the uh, chyme affects the functionality of the stomach to regulate their control. All right, and so like I said, the goal is of our small intestine is to control the rate that the stomach empties so that we can maximize the efficiency of our digestion. And then once we complete our digestion, obviously we need to also be focused on, oops absorption as well. In fact, as I mentioned, there are four absorption pathways we are going to talk about, and I guarantee one of them is going to be an essay question on your exam. And quite frankly, all four of them will be a, uh, you know, a uh, essay question on the exam. You will get at least one of them. So, because that's the way the exam works now. Everybody gets different random exams. So all of them will be on there. So who knows which one you have? I don't, but you'll have one of them. So we will talk about that on Monday. Make sure you read those ahead of time and think about them. For those absorption pathways, we need to know where the chemical digestion takes place, where the mechanical digestion takes place, how it gets across the apical uh, border, how it gets across the basal border of that absorptive cell. And on top of that is if that isn't enough, we are going to map the pathway that that nutrient is going to take to get all the way back to the uh, right ventricle, uh, pardon me, right atrium of your heart. So that will be a fun thing that we get to do on uh, Monday. So I encourage you to take a peek at that ahead of time. Your book does a pretty good job of describing these with some really nice pictures, but we will go over it together. All right. How are we on time? Uh, one last quick thing. Let's go ahead and go over this because again, it won't take a lot of time. We've already talked about it. Again, our intestinal is involved in the mechanical digestion with that process of segmentation. 
that we talked about. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about movement of our small of our uh, digestive system, alternating contractions of the circular layers. This mashes the food back and forth, continues our mechanical digestion, but it also helps to facilitate the, the chemical digestion because it mixes it with the enzymes. It also rubs it on those breast border enzymes and it also facilitates absorption. So that a segmentation does all of those things. It's mechanical digestion. It helps the chemical digestion. And it helps absorption. And now that's too big. So let's go down to there. That's too small. There, just right, baby bear. All righty. Uh, there is going to be peristalsis that occurs in the small intestine to help to move the food through. But as we talked about, we also need to be able to clear the pathways. Again, remember one of the things we talked about is that when the stomach increases its motility, uh, when we get the, uh, that secretion of the small intestine, uh, we get what is called the gastroileal reflex. This is one of our long reflexes. And as a result of this long reflex, as we talked about, we get that relaxing of the ileocecal valve, which is also facilitated by gastrin. And that helps to move the food through more quickly. So uh, increases peristalsis. To move the food through more quickly. So again, like we talked about, we can make room for the next uh, uh, bolus of food or chyme really that is coming through. Again, depending on the frequency, depending on the composition, the volume, it can take your small intestine around three to six hours to uh, empty. All righty, that is everything we need to talk about for the small intestine for now. Again, we're gonna talk about the absorptive pathway and more about the enzymes, so we'll come back to that, uh, but uh, that is good for now. That leaves us a little behind. We still need to talk about the pancreas. We need to still talk about the uh, lo uh, liver, but I will cover the uh, histology of those and the microscopic anatomy of those in uh, Friday's uh, um, histology lab. So that will save us some time and hopefully help us catch up on uh, Monday. All righty, any questions on any of that? Hopefully at this point, most of your brains are full. I can keep talking for another half an hour if you guys would like. Nobody says anything, I'll keep talking. Please God, no. <laughs> All right, that's kind of what I was expecting. All right, only one dissenter. Everybody else wants me to keep talking? No, please. I'm <laughs> crying in the background. <laughs> Okay, good. I just want to make sure you're all still awake. All right, excellent. No, I think this is a good stopping point. So I think we'll go ahead and stop here. But be aware, we still have a lot to cover. Uh, and so we'll steal some time on Friday and that will help. And then uh, we'll move on from there. So okay, excellent. Uh, then uh, if there are any more questions, I'll field any more questions. Otherwise, I will go ahead and uh, end the recording for today. I get that posted today as usual. And then I hope to see many, if not all of you on Friday as well. All right, any questions? All right, then as always, take care of yourselves, uh, study hard, but be safe, and I will see you next time.